We'll call the meeting to order. Town of Wakefield Board of Appeals for Wednesday, April 28th, 2021. Roll call of attendance. Um, Chair Dave Hatfield present. Amy Wall. Here. Carbell. Here. Jim McBain. Jim. He's on mute. Here. Thank you. Joe Pride. Here. Tom Lutby. Here. Michael Feely. Here. Greg McIntosh. Here. Thank you. All in attendance. I will proceed to the legal notice. Amy, if you please. Consistent with the governor's orders suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law, the public may not physically attend this meeting, but every effort will be made to allow the public to view and or listen to, it, to the meeting in real time. Persons who wish to do so are invited to click on the following link. If you do not have a camera or microphone on your computer, you may use the following dial-in number, 1-301-715-8592, meeting ID 878-2291-4026, passcode 276731. Please, use, please only use dial-in or computer and not both as audio feedback will distort the meeting. This meeting will be audio and video recorded. One, continued hearings. Two, 21 dash 21-51, 21-52, CCF Corner Power Property Company, LLC, application for a special permit and site plan approval under Article 6, Section 190-32 and 190-45 of the Wakefield Zoning Bylaw to allow multifamily mid-rise and garden apartment buildings containing 485 residential units mixed and combined with a restaurant use. The application for a special permit under Article 6, Section 190 31, I'm sorry, 32.1 of the Wakefield Zoning Bylaw, allowing reductions and or alterations to diminish so dimensional controls, which are required under Section 190 32D and or Table 2, dimensional, Table of Dimensional Regulations. The requested reductions and or alterations include an and are not limited to requirements relating to height application for a special permit under Article 4, Section 190-23 of the Wakefield Zone Bylaw to allow restaurant use. The property is shown as map 01, lot parcels AM1 of the assessor's map and is located at 200 through 400 Corner Power Parkway. 21-53, Michael Mormino, application for a special permit under Article 9, Section 190-50 of the Wakefield Zoning Bylaw, allowing the raising of an existing detached garage and construction of a new detached garage. The property is shown as map 15, lot parcels 100 of the assessor's map and is located at 218 Burnett Street. 21-54, 21-55, 21-56, and 21-57. Albion Street Reborn LLC, application for dimensional a determination and or finding with the respect to a continuation and extension of a non-conforming uses under article 9 section 190-50b of the wakefield zoning bylaw to change the use of the second and third floors of the commercial to residential use application for a variance under article 6 190-32b of the wakefield zoning bylaw to allow a reduction in the square footage allowed per apartment Application for a variance under Article 6, Section 190-32B1 of the Wakefield Zoning Bylaw to allow mixed use on a lot that does not meet the minimum square footage requirements. Application for a special permit under Article 7, Section 190-36C of the Wakefield Zoning Bylaw, requesting a reduction in the requirements of, of off-street parking for the proposed apartment. The property is shown as map 12, lot parcels 134A of the assessor's map and is located at 13 through 15 Albion Street. 21-58, Mass Minimont 2, Inc. Application for special permit under Article 4, Section 190-23 of the Wakefield Zoning Bylaw to incorporate fast food in conjunction, conjunction with its existing convenience store use. The property is shown as map 17, lot parcels 179 of the assessor's map and is located at 10 through 12 Vernon Street. 21-59, Elizabeth A. Lombardo, application for a variance under Article 10, Section 190-66 of the Wakefield Zoning Bylaw, seeking to modify <coughs> related to the premises granted by the board on October 5th, 2020 
to allow a modification to the existing family dwelling by changing the roof line and or adding a dormer. The property is shown as map 32, lot parcel 63A of the assessor's map and is located at 249 Nahant Street, 21-60, 21-61. Keith J. Uh, Bernardo and Nicole J. Bernardo, application for a special permit under Article 6, Section 190-32G2 of the Wakefield Zoning Bylaw to convert a two-family dwelling into a three-family dwelling application for a variance under Article 10, Section 190-66 of the Wakefield Zoning Bylaw, seeking a variance from the requirements of Section 190-32G2 related to the conversion of a two-family dwelling into a three-family dwelling. The property is shown as map 17, lot parcel 18 of the assessor's map, and is located at 17 Park Street. 21-62, Christopher M. Frenny and uh, Marilisa Frenny, Application for determination and or finding with respect to a continuation of an extension of non-conforming uses under Article 9, Section 190-50 of the Wakefield Zoning Bylaw to construct an addition onto an existing dwelling. The property is shown as Map 34, Lot Parcels A15 of the Assessor's Map and is located at 16 James Street. Board of Appeals. Whew, that was a long one. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> As everyone can see, we have another busy agenda this evening. Please have a drink of water. <laughs> right. Catch your breath. A um, few quick reminders again, if anyone hasn't been attending these uh, Zoom meetings from the town before. Um, uh, the chat feature has been disabled, so all discussion will take place in the meeting room itself. I'd ask everyone to please share the video and audio in the meeting room as we would do during the regular public hearings in the conference room, unless there are technical limitations. Um, the applicant will present their information and testimony. We ask all applicants on the agenda this evening to please be prepared um, to have electronic copies of their plans to share in the meeting room. Everyone is enabled to share when it's their turn to do so. Uh, we'll discuss the uh, application with the uh, petitioners. Um, and then after that, we'll read any correspondence and then uh, welcome any public testimony. When we do so, I'll ask you to raise your hand and you can do so in the Zoom room. And I will call on you uh, in the order that I see them. Last year, name and address for the record. Any votes will be taken via a roll call vote, as we did for the attendance. And again, uh, when it is the time to speak, uh, I would ask that you just please raise your hand in the Zoom meeting room. Uh, and with that, we will get started. So the first hearing on our agenda was a continued hearing. It reversed a letter from uh, their attorney to request a continuance. Um, so in case anyone's here for that, we'll take that up front. Um, dated April 28th, 2021 from Brian McGrail regarding SGD Management Group LLC at 97 and 99 Water Street in Wakefield. Case numbers 21-43 and 24. Is that 43 and 44? Yes, 43 and 44. Okay. Um, asking us to continue the hearing to our May 12th meeting. Still work in the process of working on revisions requested by the board at our last hearing. I move that we continue this to the May 12th hearing. Second. Any discussion? All in favor, Chip? Yes. Amy? Yes. Jim? Yes. Thank you, Joe. Yes. Tom? Yes. Mike? Yes. And Greg? Yes. I vote yes. Okay, so that's unanimous. So if anyone is here for the Water Street application, we'll next hear that on May 12th. Now, um, before we launch into the new hearings, we wanted to take up a, a matter that we expect to be rather quick, more of a follow-up to uh, the previous uh, hearings at 27 and 37 Water Street. We have attorney Michael McCarthy here with us this evening uh, to give us some updates uh, from our last or our previous hearing, I think a couple meetings ago, um, where we finalized and updated some, uh, some plans. There were a few punch list items still to go uh, on the property and Mike can share us uh, some updates and uh, next steps so that we can uh, move this one along. So Mike. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So yes, you're correct. On February 10th, we were before the board. We went over the, um, the as-built site plan, which was approved. Uh, the board voted to allow for a $15,000 assurity uh, to be posted to ensure that uh, landscaping, uh, parking lot striping and sidewalk construction uh, would be completed to the satisfaction of the board and in compliance with the plans. Um, Mr. Chairman, UI and town council had some discussions about the best way to accomplish that. And ultimately it was decided it would be best if the work just got 
completed since it was um, it was apparent that that could be done or, or we thought it could be done relatively quickly. Uh, along those lines, um, it's my client's position that the landscaping and the striping have been completed. Um, the irrigation system uh, had been installed, needed some repairs. It has been repaired. Uh, we did some sent some photos and showing you the working the working system, uh, and the plants are per the plan. Um, that leaves the sidewalks. So um, we had a um, a number of discussions with the town engineer um, through you know works under the DPW, and they had some suggestions all along the way about uh, particulars relating to the sidewalk. So we we engaged the town engineer. Um, uh, went over some revised, uh, some detailed plans, sidewalk plans with him, met on site. When I say we, I mean um, the project engineer, uh, my client and I, along with the town engineer and his staff. Um, we identified several difficulties. Long story short, <clears throat> there are some issues with respect to um, the little, the very um, small reveal on the curve out in front of uh, Sunny Nodos. Um, and some of those curves may have to be lifted there were also some issues with respect to a small section of sidewalk with meeting the, um, the requirements of the ADA in terms of grading front to back or back to front from street to building. Um, the net net is that the town engineer suggested and we have agreed that we should let the town do the work. The town wants to do the work from, it would connect the rail trail in front of uh, our, our, I'll call it our site, um, past Sunny Notos and up to uh, the work of, work limit that the town's gonna to engage in on some main street work. Um, it would allow us to solve a number of problems, um, including the street grading, the lifting of the curb um, in compliance with ADA. All that work would be controlled by the town and paid for by my client. Uh, the town engineer has come up with the, um, the cost of work. It's over $24,000 <clears> and um, my client has agreed to pay the town um, that amount of money to allow the town to do the work. Um, the, I think the town engineer considers it a better solution. Frankly, although it's more expensive, so too does my client. Um, it eliminates the prospect of any um, disagreement over the nature, the nature of the scope of the work. It also solves some issues. We were gonna bring the sidewalk in front of 2737 into 88 compliance right now. The, the sidewalk would have to slope toward the building and the water would spill toward the building, which is obviously not something that we want to, to have happen. Um, this way, the town controls the scope of the work, the timing of the work, the quality of the work. <clears throat> it ensures ADA compliance. It also ensures that both ends of the sidewalk match up with what the town wants at the rail trail and um, up toward Main Street. So that's essentially it. My client's prepared to pay the money on Monday uh, to ensure that that work gets done the way the town engineer wants it done. Um, and hopefully you know, it resolves all the issues with the board as well. Um, it's a different form of surety, I suppose, um, a much more liquid form and uh, addresses the points. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Mike? Yes. Um, does, does the town have any time frame? I know, Jim, I, I, I don't know. I, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I, I see these funds once in a while go and it just goes year after year and nothing gets done. And I'm, I'm wondering whether I would think we want to see something done. I understand that switching control here uh, basically is into somebody else's time frame, And I'm fine personally with basically the town taking over the responsibility because as we know, it's, uh, it's coordinating the whole, that whole edge basically for quite a distance. But I'm really concerned that this fund just sits in a pot somewhere and the work doesn't get done for a long time. Well, I understand that. It's been, you know, the position of the board all along that we should defer to the DPW whatever the DPW wanted, we should be doing with respect to the sidewalks. Uh, this is what they want. Um, it's more expensive for my client. We too would rather see the work done sooner rather than later because it benefits my client. Um, but, you know, um, it's, it's, within the, it's within the control of the town to, uh, to deal with town issues um, and town sidewalk. It's town property that we're talking about. And can we get some sort of commitment from them as to uh, some sort of time frame, even if it's you know, even if it's sort of like between here and there somewhere. We can certainly try. It might be better coming from the board than from I or my client, but I'm happy to, um, I'm happy to make the request. Dave, what do you think? Yeah, I'm fine with that. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm fine doing that. Again, I, I still think um, 
I think we were waiting for some of these items to be done to just do a final final walkthrough. So I'd like to still do that. Just make sure board members are comfortable, either Jim or Chip. I think one of you was going to go out and just well, make sure that. If we can get if we can get this this piece of it sort of nailed down, which sounds like we're pretty close to it, I'm perfectly willing to go over there and, and finish up the last pieces basically and just close it. Okay. Great. Well, the other one will be paperwork. I just I got to correspond with the town engineer. You know, they sent an email. I was copied. I'd like to see it maybe in a letter form, and maybe put some constructs. You know, some some boundaries around it, as you said. So I'm willing to do that um, on behalf of the board, um, just to get it in writing. And then with um, with the client, um, you know, submitting the check, so we know that that is taking place. And then we just um, and then we can write a letter to the building inspector and say, given this, you know, the current status and this agreement, you know, then they've satisfied our conditions. And the building inspector, again, don't know if there's any other outstanding points, but it, it he would he would know that we, they've met our conditions at that point. So, Chip, did you right. have something else? Or yeah, I. I mean, I know Jim's trying to get the town to commit to a time frame. I don't think you're ever going to get that. Um, they might give a rough time frame like this year, next year type thing. Um, <clears throat> I, I, I'm a bit frustrated that it's come to that because it would be nicer to have the work done as, as Mr. McCarthy has suggested that his client would also like to do uh, because it will benefit his properties as well. So I guess we can reach out, but I don't think that the decision to allow this to happen or not should be based on us getting a time frame from the town that we're satisfactory with, because that puts uh, Michael and his and his uh, owner in in a precarious position. So if the engineering department is, is willing to do this, I think we should go along with it. Okay, they're also moving a curb cut, right? To move the driveway. So it's not just That's cool. redoing the curb or regrading the street, it's it moving because the parking, the way that lane comes out. So it's, it's, it's to everyone's benefit that that gets done in a reasonable time frame. So we can ask and I'll pursue, um, but uh, anyone else? The town controls the timing in any event. Well, we can express to them that we want this project to be done. Everyone wants this project to be done. So even though if they're willing to take it over, we'd still like to have it a priority and not something that, as, as Jim said, you know, just sits for two years because it's tied to some other work and then it's, you know, like rail trail and it's not quite ready for that. And so it just sits. So at least they could do in front of this property and tie it in with whatever the larger plan is um, when that when that time arrives. But uh, okay. Anyone else? Okay. Um, so as I said, and Mike, as you uh, stated, we had previously agreed to do this. It would just, and we, from offline discussions, agreed to just like get the work done. So um, um, I don't know if we need any further motions because we've already sort of agreed. I think we just, um, if we can just get an on-site check on those other aspects, and I work the the, um, the curbing part with the town engineer, um, you know, we'll we'll try to put this to bed. Yeah, absolutely. My clients uh, will be available um, from Monday on, so whatever works for uh, Chip and Jim, um, we'll make work on our end. Okay. All right. We can collaborate offline and set up a time. I, I we did get the pictures, but just to walk the site quickly and yeah, absolutely check check the links yeah, as well but mike i'm, I'm going to want to see the sprinklers run in all the beds because we saw some pictures but we didn't see pictures in every bed so i i do want them to be prepared to run through the zones oh uh, okay just so you know pictures don't count help <laughs> but they don't finalize it trust but verify yeah <laughs> yeah got it all right all right, if there's nothing else, thanks, Mike, for attending. I appreciate it. Right, thank you all. Okay. And uh, we'll be in touch. Thank appreciate you. it. Thank you. All right. Good luck tonight. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> all right, with that, we are going to proceed into our new hearings for the evening. The first one being 21 50, 51, and 52 CCF Quantipower Property Company LLC 
a 200 to 400 quanta power parkway. Great, if I may, Mr. Chair. Welcome, Brian, absolutely. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the board, public for the record, attorney Brian McGrail on behalf of CCF Quanta Power Property Company, LLC, the applicant for special permits for multifamily mid-rise and garden apartment buildings containing 485 residential units mixed and combined with a resident use, I'm sorry, with a restaurant use uh, on the subject property. Uh, I'm gonna ask Ali, could you bring up the PowerPoint? Please, thank you. Great, that's fine, Ali, appreciate it. Um, I'd like to give um, kind of a brief overview of an agenda that we have scheduled that we'd like to accomplish with the board tonight, Mr. Chair. First, uh, I'm gonna make an introduction um, of the project team. I'd like to give the board some site, site history, talk about a, a zoning overview, existing conditions on the site. Uh, then we have objectives that will be presented by Jay Doherty and Matt D'Amico of Cabot Cabin and Forbes. Uh, then we have some landscaping details and design details that Ian Ramey will go over. He's from Copley Wolf Design Group. Uh, and then we have architecture. Uh, Ali Adams from Cube, Fee, uh, Cube 3 will make a presentation on that. And then I will uh, do a conclusion. And then obviously we're happy to um, answer uh, any questions uh, that the board might have. I think you, as you can surmise from that agenda, uh, our goal tonight is to give what I what I would say is a good broad overview of the project, uh, knowing that we will get into the details of all aspects of the project at subsequent meetings of the board. Uh, and on projects of this nature, it's it's my experience that this is how the board normally likes to proceed. So we're prepared to do that. Um, Appreciate that, Brian. Just real quick, if I can interject. Um, have you gone through these slides? Like how many slides? We just, as you heard, we have a busy agenda. This is obviously a big project, but. Do, do you have a sense of how long we think it'll take? I'd say you're here? probably looking at 45 minutes. Okay, let's see if we can do that because I think there's going to be some initial public input as well. And we just like to sort of time box it if we can, maybe an hour or so, because we know this is an introduction. Yeah, I think that's reasonable. We're going to move, okay. you know, I think it's important for us to set the table for the board and, and, the, and that's our goal and for the public uh, and everybody to, to have a full understanding of what we're proposing at this time. Understood. So, Just so that, that's yep. our goal. Um, okay. I'm, I'm, I'd like to reference all members of our presentation team, not all of who are here or will present tonight, but it is likely that they will participate as the meetings on this project progress uh, before your board. So uh, obviously uh, myself uh, representing um, the applicant, uh, my co-counsel on this is Peter Tam from Goulston and Stores. Peter is on the Zoom tonight. The development team is Cabot Cabin and Forbes. Um, Jay Darty, Matt D'Amico, and John Sullivan on their behalf. Uh, a development partner of Cabot Cabin and Forbes is Eastern Real Estate, and Don Briggs, the managing director of Eastern, uh, is on and could be involved as we move forward. Uh, landscaping is, uh, has been designed by Copley Wolf Design Group. Uh, Ian Ramey will present uh, throughout the project and the hearings on that aspect. As I've mentioned, Cube 3 is the architects, and Ali Adams is our lead architect. Uh, site Civil is Alan and Major. Nick Delacova, Nick Delacava is here uh, and will present. And also, I anticipate that Tim Williams might be involved also. We actually have a wetland scientist uh, on this project, um, uh, Goddard Consulting, Scott Goddard. Uh, and finally, our transportation is Vanessa and Associate Scott Thornton, um, who I think the board uh, is familiar with. Scott has been involved uh, in other projects before the board. So, uh, Ali, if you could go to the next slide, I'd appreciate that. Great, thank you. Um, slide, this slide really, I wanna familiarize the board with the subject property. Um, sometimes it will be referred to as a site throughout our presentation. Uh, the property is known and numbered as 200-400 Quanta Power Parkway. It's shown as lot AM1 on map one of the Wakefield Assessors map. Uh, this site was developed uh, in approximately 1957 as office space with over 600 surface parking spaces. It was a longtime home to American Mutual Insurance Company. Um, they were there for a number of years until they vacated. And then it served as offices for other corporate entities over the years. For the most part, 
it remained unchanged until approximately 2010 when the existing when the existing office space uh, was modified uh, to include a data center with the associated massive outdoor generator farm that I think folks are familiar with until that operator vacated the site some time ago. And since then it has pretty much gone un underutilized. Um, so that familiarizes you with the location, which I'm sure you already are aware of. And Ali, if you could please go to the next slide. Great, this is a kind of a snapshot of our uh, zoning map. Um, the site is extremely large. It actually consists of approximately 24 acres of land and it is located primarily in the limited business zoning district with a very small portion in the business district out near the uh, Lowell Street uh, end of the site. Uh, as far as zoning is concerned, the proposed uses uh, are allowed in the applicable zoning uh, district pursuant to special permits and site plan approval from your board, which we've applied for and we're seeking. With the site's significant acreage, the site could qualify for up to 870 residential units pursuant to section 19032 of our zoning bylaw if your board were inclined to give a special permit. Uh, but that's a density calculation that works out for the, for the site. Um, you may recall that we appeared before your board on May 13, 2020 regarding this site for a pre-application meeting with my client's initial concept plan that included approximately 600 residential units with six story buildings. That was about a year ago. We walked away from that meeting recognizing that we had a lot of work to do to address the concerns and or issues raised by your board that evening and also the concerns of stakeholders um, such as the Friends of Lake Wanapawa. So for approximately the next year, uh, my client went to work uh, to meet and collaborate with stakeholders such as the Friends of Lake Wanapawa in deriving important design standards for this project uh, that will be a guide uh, to get us into the plan development that has been presented and that you will see some of tonight. Um, these design standards not only resulted in limiting the height and number of stories of the buildings, because now we have uh, two three-story buildings and one four-story building, but the design standards also resulted in, in, in improved quality of lake water to lake water quality, resulted in public access to more open space and pathways in the creation and protection of significant conservation areas in perpetuity. The value and input in participation of the Friends of Lake Wanapawit in the design standard process as the plans were developed cannot be understated and it is very much appreciated and well done. We believe that as the hearings on this project progress, it will become extremely evident that the project will have a tremendous beneficial environmental impact to the lake, its watershed, and its total water quality. Um, I also wanna point out that as, as well as your board, the Conservation Commission has jurisdiction over this project. So we're in the process of filing with them and we will be going through hearings concurrently with them as we proceed through your board. Um, Ali, if you could go to the next slide. Thank you. Um, I also wanted to point out that this site was uh, considered um, as part of the housing production plan uh, that was approved by the Department of, of, of Housing and Community <laughs> Development uh, back in 2015. Um, that was um, done by Abacus Architects on behalf of the town, Abacus Architects and Planners in conjunction with our town planner, Paul Revis at the time. Um, and as you can see, um, that plan contemplated this site, this area, uh, in essence, for this type of, um, of development. This is a cut sheet from that report, and it states an entire mixed use lakeside development is an exciting possibility with jobs, restaurants, and both affordable and market rate housing. Much of this district is removed from the lakeside neighborhood and could accommodate mid rise or even low rise. I'm sorry, even low high rise building Wakefield housing production plan. I want to acknowledge that that plan technically has expired, you know, less than about a year ago, I think just over a year. Uh, but it certainly is uh, still referenced on our town uh, website. 
And I think it is uh, also a, a value in a guide and does have relevance uh, on this project. Um, if we could go to uh, the next slide, Sally. Did you go to the next slide? I'm having a little. Okay, just popped up, thank you. Um, just again, to familiarize the board with the site in a little bit more detail, kind of zooming in on it. Um, as you can see, um, the property abuts 128, Route 128 on its rear side, and obviously uh, abuts the town property in the lake on the other side. It has um, access from Quanta Power Parkway right out to North Avenue, Route 128. Uh, and then heading towards down and also downtown and also has access out to Lowell Street, which takes you to the Rotary uh, and out towards Linfield. Um, there is what we've done here to kind of help the board. We've, we've kind of delineated the best we could the property line um, because we wanted to give you an idea of where the public land is. We've kind of labeled that. Um, there's also a significant open area on the site. We've, we've designated it as woodlands. There's wetlands mixed in there, but there are some uplands when it's been dry for a while, you are able to walk in there. Um, so that is an area that will be preserved as you'll see as we, as we go through the process. Um, you know, I think one thing to stress on this as, as we go through it, um, when you look at these existing conditions, um, this is a redevelopment plan. <laughs> Um, you can see that basically, except for that woodland area, which I referenced, which we are not going to disturb, um, the site is, is pretty much maxed out development wise with impervious area. Uh, significant parking spaces, um, the, the generator farm, which we've uh, pointed to, the generators are no longer there. Uh, they've been removed, uh, but um, it's still just a flat uh, impervious uh, space. Uh, and the building is uh, covers a good part of the lot, but where there's no um, garage parking on this site, the parking lot uh, takes up um, a, a pretty good area, uh, as you can see. Allie? Um, really just kind of want to uh, point out to some of the existing uh, conditions of the site. Um, as I've mentioned, this is a redevelopment site. Um, I think, um, you know, and I would encourage this to board members because um, I've done it recently, spend some time out there, walk the site. Um, you'll notice uh, a lot of the infrastructure, um, some of which is shared with the town is in a state of disrepair. Uh, it does need to be redeveloped. Um, and um, there's a lot of pavement work that, you know, will obviously be totally removed and redone as part of this project. Uh, go ahead, Alec, to the next. Um, as I've mentioned, I think as we go through the hearing process, um, it's going to be quite evident of the um, environmental impact, uh, the positive environmental impact that this project will have on the lake. Um, the American Mutual site originally in 1957, when they developed properties then, they did not have the same stormwater management standards and requirements that are in place today. So there is virtually no water treatment on that site. Um, you can see from these photos in the top left, that's like an, a, a, an old drainage swale that water just flows off of the parking lot into the wetlands, which is in obviously the watershed of the lake. Um, and then, you know, you can see the, the um, old um, generator farm at the bottom, which has now been vacated, just total impervious. Um, this should be you see all the broken curving. This should be the um, this should be the poster child, if you will, for the board when you require um, granite curbing and not allow bituminous, because this <laughs> this is like the picture perfect. I think Mr. Tabell might put this uh, in his, his save file to pull it up because this is evidence of what happens. And th and then you know because the site is being is really underutilized. If you walk through there, you're going to see certain things happening there that you know I don't think are. are are good for the site is you know people are kind of doing their own thing up there you can see they're throwing picnic tables out wherever they want i noticed that more than one spot right up on the water um, they're kind of creating their own sitting areas it's kind of like people are just doing um, what they want up there and and um, i think um, some more more of a, a plan which we hope to implement uh, for the open area and the public area uh, would be beneficial uh, not only to the site in the lake but to the public as a whole um, next slide. Uh, 
Okay, I think um, I think I'm going to hand it over to Jay. Are you are you ready? Yes, I'm available. If you can all hear me. Yes, we can. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Board. Uh, my name is Jay Doherty. I'm the CEO of Cabot Cabot and Forbes. Just very quickly, because I'd like to spend your time focused upon the project that we're proposing. Uh, CCNF is the oldest development firm in New England, founded in 1904. Uh, and I like to emphasize that we are a greater Boston firm. We're here, you can reach us. You don't have to call Los Angeles. We're accountable to you and we're available to you at any time. Um, over the years, we have become increasingly focused, not on just building buildings, but creating places. Uh, often at transit and very often on waterfronts. We've built several projects along the Charles River. Uh, we have built along the Mystic, the Malden, uh, the Ipswich rivers. So we're used to dealing in sensitive locations. We're very often dealing in redevelopment. What you see here today is a project called Charles River Landing in the upper right-hand screen that is built along the Charles River and you see the walkway path in the lower right-hand screen, screen that we created along the Charles River. In the middle screen on top is a waterfront park. This is more formal treatment that's sometimes adopted uh, called the Mystic River Waterfront Park, uh, really uh, part of a chain of waterfronts that's been developed in that area, spanning Mystic uh, River over to Assembly Square. Uh, our most recent project that is now opening is called the Overlook, it's at, uh, a former abandoned monastery in Brighton, 12 acre abandoned monastery, rather large site, a very tall site on a hill. And uh, we inherited uh, two historic properties. One was a monastery, which is in the upper left hand corner. You can see that's now restored and open. And one was a church, St. Gabriel's Church, very large church, uh, as well as an, an abandoned Olmstead Park uh, and other features. Uh, we've recently been proud to be awarded what's called the Menino Legacy Award. It's uh, done by uh, Preservation Massachusetts. It uh, will be announced May 21st. And it really captures what we try and do with our projects. We understand that the sites that we're involved with are really places that need to enrich and engage with the community. And I think what we did this particular project is in Brighton. It uses the words transformative, cat uh, catalytic, embracing the community, creating partnerships, and revitalizing. And when we look at uh, Lake Quantipoet and we look at this site, it's an important site. It's the gateway in that area to the town of Wakefield. It's highly visible. Uh, and today it is a blighted site. Uh, 128 is dominant. Uh, the building is in extraordinary disrepair. There is no infrastructure that really supports the health of the lake. Um, it's really not a fully safe site. It's uh, poorly lit, got a lot of undergrowth. All of those situations we've worked with before, I will tell you that it takes a major effort to be transformative in this situation. You have a variety of issues to deal with, engaging with the community, and it takes a significant investment to uh, reverse and to rebuild in this, in this situation. So what you'll hear us talk about tonight uh, is things we've drawn from the town's own studies, from the town administration, from the Friends of the Lake and others to set a series of discrete objectives that we hope capture what you think may be the best way to enshrine a place that invites the community, that invites the public and celebrates the lake. Ali, if you could proceed on to the next slide. Um, what I'm going to do is ask our project manager, Matt D'Amico. And as I said, we've tried to distill what we have heard and what we have taken in to a series of about 10 design objectives. And we try and articulate those objectives and then illustrate what we're trying to do with the project to achieve those design objectives. Go ahead, Matt, would you please? Thank you, Jay. My name is Matt D'Amico. I'm a project manager at Kappa Kappa Forbes. I've had the pleasure of working with this project for about the last year now. Uh, in that time, I had the pleasure of working with the town uh, as well as its community groups, namely uh, the Friends of Lake Quantipowit, to try to develop a plan that is responsive and suitable for this site. And I think our proposal tonight to the board reflects what we've heard from the community. And 
I just like to quickly take you through some of these uh, design objectives that we've heard and what we're adopting into our planning for the site. So first, conservation areas. So as part of, of our plan here, we are proposing three separate conservation areas totaling just under 13 acres of land. Uh, one being the, the, the nine acre woodland on the eastern edge of the site, two acres of wetland buffer, and over one acre of publicly accessible land, which would be an uh, expansion of public open space currently available at the site. This is critical for our redevelopment. Um, I, what we, we're currently preserving are in only redeveloping the currently disturbed area and adding an additional 13 acres of open space. Secondly, a big design objective of ours uh, was environmental and reducing impervious area on the site. So the site currently today is, is covered in, in asphalt and parking spaces and other impervious surfaces uh, and has very, very limited stormwater management project proposes to remove 485 on-site per uh, surface parking spaces and increase pervious area by over one acre. Uh, and per perhaps most importantly, the project proposes a robust stormwater management system, which will greatly reduce runoff into Lake Quantipaw and will improve the long-term health of Lake Quantipaw. We're also expanding publicly accessible pathways on the site. Um, as part of our project, we're proposing uh, to create an additional lake path on our site. What we heard in working with the town is that there is not a very clear delineation today between public and private st space at the front door of 200 Quantipowit. Um, it, it often feels like the 200 Quantipowit existing building is encompassing the town owned land, which actually uh, is directly adjacent, adjacent to the site. So as a way to make a clear delineation between public and private land and make that public land really more usable, we are creating a lake path on our property line, which is going to encompass um, you know, rain gardens and uh, will be very functional for creating public space that's very usable and honestly creating a new open space on Lake Wanapawa that otherwise doesn't really exist today. Another thing we heard, which we are looking to incorporate and are proposing today, are pub public uh, facilities with inside our building uh, for public use. A few of those facilities include a, a cafe. We're proposing a cafe that walkers of the lake can enjoy. That'll include some outdoor seating. Um, we are also including restrooms as part of that cafe that are going to be available for public use for people walking the lake, something that the lake currently doesn't have. Uh, in communications that we've had with the uh, with Wakefield Police, we are also uh, we, we heard it to be a good idea to include some kind of public safety facility at our site. Um, you know, there is currently a, a bike patrol of Lake Quantipaw currently, but with with no outposts to stop at. So, um, as part of our project, we will be include, including a public safety room, which will be work as an outpost for Wakefield Police. A big concern that we heard early on in the project um, was about height and, and making sure that the massing of this project is, is reasonable and modest um, given its proximity to Lake Quantipawit. And we heard that and what we're proposing today is we are capping, or at least in our proposal, we are capping the height of buildings closest to Lake Quantipawit at three stories, which is about 32 feet. Um, so uh, you can go to the next slide, Ali. Our, our second or our third building on the site, building three, will only step up to four stories. Um, we are also positioning that building uh, purposefully to screen Route 128 from noise and traffic impacts, which are currently felt throughout all of Lake Quantipau. If, uh, if you sit on the town commons, you can know, you can hear Route 128 from there. Um, so we are pur purposefully designing our project to deaden some of that noise. Our seventh objective here um, is we will be providing 87 affordable housing units uh, available for moderate income households. As you saw earlier in the presentation, you saw that Quantipau Parkway is currently in disrepair. Um, for our on-site portions of Lake Quantipau, or sorry, rather Quantipau Parkway, which is the majority of the parkway itself, uh, we are proposing to completely rebuild it with granite curbing throughout 
and a modern drainage system to handle a lot of the problems uh, that it currently has. You know, today and date, this parkway is not really functional, um, and we are going to put it into a state of very nice condition. Ninth objective here is to commit to the long-term improvement of water quality of Lake Quanapowit. A lot of what that includes is both on-site and off-site measures, on-site management of our stormwater and our runoff. Um, but on top of that, we're also committing to some off-site projects um, identified by the Clean Lake Committee as top priority projects, um, which will in the long run uh, improve water quality, the water quality of Lake Quanapowit by minimizing runoff in different areas surrounding uh, Lake Quanapowit. And our 10th priority is really to design this as a safe site, safe and secure site. So we have a commitment um, to including 24 seven security services on the site, a gated garage access system, security cameras, uh, video intercom access, and license, license plate recognition technology so that we are ensuring we're going above and beyond to make sure that when we are establishing this residential community at the head of the lake, um, that this is a really a responsible program that is not only taking into account the environmental uh, and design issues, but also just human safety uh, issues that you know, face the town. So thank you. Are we going to go to Ian here, Matt? I think yes, so. This would be Ian. Ian, you're up. Thank you very much. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Ian Ramey. I'm a landscape architect and principal with Copley Wolf Design Group. It's very good to be with you this evening. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about the landscape, um, not in super detail, but just to a level to kind of highlight some of the big moves that we are proposing and keeping in mind that we're going to dial into a more detailed discussion, obviously, as the process unfolds and we get into some um, discussions with the CONSCOM. I thought to start out um, just to highlight the idea of how uh, we're improving the site generally is to start with a, a little more detailed uh, discussion of the existing conditions. So the slide that you see in front of you shows the existing condition. And uh, basically it's 41% of that site area is existing impervious surface. That's a combination of buildings, asphalt, um, and obviously the, the big concrete pads and so forth that are out there. That equates to about 425,000 square feet of dark colored asphalt, dark colored roof. That's a heat gain issue. That's a solar gain issue. Um, it's not a great condition. We also noted that there really is no stormwater management um, currently in place out there. It's a dated system. It's a failing system. There's really no treatment of the surface water uh, as it runs off into the lake, which is a huge problem. So all in all, it's really not a, a very environmentally sensitive um, existing condition. And if you go to the next slide, please. So here's what we're proposing. This is the, the new plan, and you can see that we are uh, significantly reducing the amount of impervious coverage. We're now down to um, 36%. And I think the other part to note here is that, um, like we said before, there isn't any stormwater management. We are now bringing in a very robust um, system of stormwater management with many different facets of it. One of the more interesting ones and significant ones um, are some of the low impact development strategies that we're proposing, namely an extensive system of rain gardens. So we're proposing about 26,000 square feet of new rain gardens. These rain gardens are, are going to be able to uh, capture and treat 22,000 cubic feet of stormwater on site. These rain gardens are going to be able to basically reduce the runoff and filter out sediments and pollutants um, by virtue of the plants in those uh, rain gardens that are gonna be able to uptake those materials. So it, it all equates to basically um, a significant decrease in the amount of untreated water that goes into the lake and therefore improves the lake quality. I'd also like to note that uh, we are proposing nearly 200 new shade trees, native shade trees that will contribute to the overall site's resiliency. And then just generally, you know, the site largely consists of pavement and lawn and the overall overarching approach of the landscape design is to really bring this sort of ecologically restorative approach where we're replacing those surfaces with biodiverse native plantings, adapted plantings, plantings that can support habitat, plantings that are pollinator friendly, 
uh, plantings that really boost up the site's overall um, resiliency. Next slide, please. And so here's just some quick sketches of what that, what form those uh, landscape improvements will take. So the upper image is a really quick conceptual sketch that we worked on and shared with the Friends of the Lake, showing how the rain gardens might work and how that might integrate with the public realm. The thought here is that these rain gardens really are um, um, extensive, integrated, diverse, colorful objects that are part of the core of what the landscape is. We want these to be focal elements that people engage with and understand and participate in and have them be really beautiful and functional elements. You can get a sense of some of the planting strategies that we're showing. Um, okay. So, okay, so here we are with this slide here basically shows um, the conservation of land. So uh, as Matt had mentioned, we have the nine acres of woodland, the two uh, acres of the wetlands buffer, and then importantly, that 1.3 acres of new publicly accessible land. That equates to about 53% of the overall site is going to be now conserved land. Um, that 1.3 acres basically increases that existing parkland by about 40%. Next slide. And then the final objective from a site and landscape perspective really is to get into the expansion and enhancement of the public realm, the public open spaces. So we have the existing lake path, which is beloved and which will remain in place. We're not altering that. As Matt had mentioned, we're introducing a new um, path. It's in this new, newly added open space. That path really becomes sort of the demarcation point between the public and private land. It, it creates a very welcoming open space and kind of makes the transition from the public park to the private part of the development. The new path intertwines with the landscape elements like the rain gardens and really is a rich public open space element that uh, we think the, the folks will enjoy. Interior to the site, we have a uh, residential street, a slow street where we have raised crossing tables so that pedestrians feel comfortable walking through there. It'll be a tree lined street. The sidewalks associated that will connect to an outdoor cafe terrace on the southern side of the building with uh, lake views, and then a larger um, open space plaza at the heart of the site that has a series of public bench seating, smaller areas for gathering, and really kind of engages with those first floor active uses. So we see a really vibrant and kind of active um, open space element. And then the last thing to point out, um, with the reconstruction of uh, the Parkway Road in full, we're proposing to introduce traffic calming measures there so that it's not a, a, a speedway people want to cut through. It can actually turn into sort of a shared use between bicyclists and vehicles and, and be something that is actually an amenity to the people using the site. Next slide. And then just some quick vignettes of what this public space feels like. So the upper left is an image of what the residential street will look like. You see the street trees, you see the plantings, you see the activation of those first floor units out onto the streetscape. The lower left, you show the image of the uh, path sort of nestled into the planting palette and how that could work. And then you have in the middle, some images of public seating nestled within um, small plaza spaces. The idea of public benches that are integrated into the planting. And then the idea of sort of an enriched public experience through use of specialty materials like salvaged materials. We have some boulders on site we can reuse and then specialty pavers that sort of make a special pedestrian place. And then with that, I'll hand it over to Allie. Thank you. Thank you, Ian. Thanks everyone. Thank you, Ian. Um, I'm Allie Adams. I'm an architect at Cube3. So we're going to jump into the site plan here. And I think up until this point, we've really um, discussed the public lakefront land and how we plan to utilize it. But I do want to focus on the buildings and the neighborhood road and the other programming elements beyond the lakefront. Um, so each building on the site plays a role to support the public realm. Our front lake facing buildings, buildings one and two, are segmented into really what becomes four garden buildings that gently sculpt the extension of the public land and engage one edge of the new recreational path. Um, along this edge, we have residential units and we did that to reduce any excess activity, any excess lighting, um, but maintain views outward for that sense of community and security. 
It's important to note that in both of these buildings, um, there is a covered connection. So that connection goes through the center um, from the neighborhood road and the sidewalk out to a boardwalk that will take you over our proposed rain gardens and connect to the recreational path. And these connections will be open to the public. There's not going to be any security measures through them. And it'll kind of invite the public to flow in um, as they wish. So moving to the rear building, building three is located, uh, as Matt mentioned in his design objectives, to protect the site and beyond from Route 128. Um, and that really helps us create this neighborhood feel on the internal road. You can see in this rendered plan that we have walkout units at the ground floor. So those units will have a small patio or stoop and be able to walk directly out to the sidewalk without having to use an internal corridor. Um, we also have three courtyards in building three. They're purposefully placed on the neighborhood road to kind of break up the street wall on one edge. And again, to take the, the mass of the building and push it towards the highway for all of the reasons we've already discussed. Um, it's important to note too that we have our wrap garage structure in building three. Um, so that's going to be wrapped on three sides by residential units and it'll only be visible to Route 128 and from that portion of the parkway. Um, and the garage is really crucial for us as a design element to get those surface parking spaces off of the site and into a structure to, to improve our open green space and impervious calculations. Um, so for the public, as we already mentioned, we have a cafe at the south end of building one. So that's highlighted in orange and there will be a large patio associated with that cafe. Um, it will connect to our new proposed path on our property and there will be public restrooms. In the through building connection of building one, we will also have the public safety office that Matt mentioned, which was designed in accordance or planned in accordance uh, with the Wakefield police. So I do wanna get into the metrics here a little bit. Um, so in building one, we have 87 residential units and that's dispersed among three floors. So the both three floor buildings along the lake are coming in at that 32 foot height. Building two is slightly larger at 94 units. And um, as you can see from the site plan, most of our density is in the back. So building three is 304 units and that's among four floors, and four floors comes out to be 45 and a half feet. On the surface, we have 215 total surface parking spaces, and that's because we've moved a lot into the garage. So in the garage, we have those 532 structured parking spaces, which gets us to our 1.52 resident parking ratio, which does meet uh, existing Wakefield zoning code. So in summary, that's 485 units at that 1.52 parking ratio. Now I just want to do some before and after views on the site. Um, so there's a key plan in the upper left that you can reference. Right now is the existing view as you are on Lake Quanta or on are on Quantico Parkway entering from North Ave. So you can see the existing um, lake path entry on the left here. There's also a curb cut that continues into the front of the site that either turns up for surface parking or is used for existing loading. And then of course the parkway swings around um, to the left of the screen here. This is what our proposed project would look like from a similar view vantage point. Um, so the lakefront path will remain. We, it's on public land. We don't plan to touch it or alter it in any ways, but we will have our um, revised path, this path in the, along our buildings, connecting into it at this edge of the parkway. And where this edge is meeting is actually where we are eliminating um, that curb cut that goes into the loading zone. So the parkway will now only swing around and have a separate entrance to our neighborhood road and then the existing curb around the rear. But just to really flip back and forth and show you now that curb cut is gone and this has become a significantly greener view. Um, this view also has our cafe in it. So we've put out some umbrellas, something that would be reminiscent of an outdoor patio. Next, we're moving into the center of the site a little bit. 
Um, right now we're standing down the curb cut we were just looking at, looking at the existing building. The lake is kind of treated as the rear, so these are not main entry doors, they're service doors. Um, and again, it's, it's mostly asphalt, it's not a, a decorative facade element. And here, I've shifted a little bit over um, into the site, but we're looking at all three buildings and where they're intersecting in that central plaza. So in the foreground here, we have buildings one and two at three stories. They would have residential units, including um, balconies and a variety of windows and patterns and materials and textures. Um, facing our new proposed path, buffered by those rain gardens and incorporated seating elements that would all be available to the public. And in the rear, you see our four-story building, which is building three. Um, in the center, where you see that warm brick would be our main entry to building three, but you can see beyond, that's kind of where that far wall goes against Route 128. Um, my last slide here is just to again, show you a zoomed in plan of the public cafe, what we're kind of thinking. It wouldn't be um, a large, loud space that adds a lot of light, but it would be a place for you to stop and get a bottle of water or a cup of coffee and use the public restrooms. And I'll hand the mic back over to Matt D'Amico here to, to summarize all of our points. Thanks, Sally. So our 10 points, just to reiterate them, um, Point number one, create conservation areas uh, on this property, 12.7 acres of conservation space permanently protected. Reduce impervious area on the site. Expand public open space onto our site, um, as well as creating public facilities uh, within our building, such as the cafe um, and the public restrooms and the public safety office. Lowering building height um, as it compares to the existing building, uh, as well as um, you know, including lower building heights closer to the lake. Screening route, route 128, providing affordable housing, rebuilding Quantapau Parkway, improving drastically the water quality of Lake Quantapau uh, through stormwater management and offsite improvements. And our 10th priority uh, is comprehensive on-site security. And I just want to point everyone here um, in the direction that we have a, a website where you can uh, stay advised of details coming up with our project. It's coorbanize.com slash project slash Wakefield. Um, I am also personally accessible um, to talk to anyone about this project. Thank you. Thanks, Matt. Yeah, and I'd just like to add one thing that um, th that Matt talked about. We'll also uh, just add on to that, that we're obviously your board is going to require an operation and maintenance plan, um, as you always do for our property and facility and upkeep on landscaping. But um, we're also looking to have some discussions with expanding that operation and maintenance plan to include the town land um, that goes beyond us up to the lake. Um, that um, my client would like to, you know, discuss that with the appropriate officials to make to make the commitment to to help maintain that, um, so that there is no distinction from that uh, public line to where the public can go on our property. And you know, and I think it, it would be helpful for the town to have uh, that property managed by you know a professional landscape company. Uh, obviously, the conservation commission would have to ha participate and have some say in that too. But that's something that we would like to get in some discussions about. So this is this next slide, uh, Mr. Chair, is really just kind of future topics that you know we wanted to um, have a discussion with you. I just um, uh, at at the end of this meeting. Um, so I don't know if we need to go through it now. I don't know if we would it might be appropriate if we entertain questions from board members or comments, and then we can kind of table this and come back to it when we're completed. Sounds good. But it looks like the usual list and covers the bases, and yeah, we'd certainly be starting with number one as we always do. So. <laughs> Um, okay. Yeah. Why don't we do, um, why don't we do that? Um, uh, board members, if you have anything to, uh, any comments or any questions at this time based on this initial presentation. Uh, Mr. Chair, I have a question, uh, for Brian. 
Um, this many units all at once. Um, I understand it's going to take a couple of years to build, um, but and you're not going to sell them all at once. But is this going to put a strain on the school system? Uh, historically, what we one of the things that we're going to uh, submit, we've actually hired somebody to do um, uh, an economic benefit impact report um, that okay. we will be submitting. So that's a good question. You know, financial impacts of the project on the town, et cetera. So we've hired uh, an expert to write a report. We'll be submitting that in, into the board. And then one of the topics, uh, Joe, at the end was that we were, you know, obviously that was going to be one of the meeting nights that we would discuss that and have a presentation on that. Okay. Thanks, Brian. Mr. Chair, this is Greg. There's yes. a question. So, Brian, I noticed you, or maybe it was Matt spoke to it, but in the presentation, I should say, mentioned 87 units and specifically said for moderate income. I know our, our um, bylaw says low and moderate. Maybe that was just, you know, language used. And But it, it, what's the plan around those? In, I'd like to see some, you know, with a with a unit or unit count this high, if it goes there, I'm not convinced it will. Um, see some, um, I don't know, bigger effort than tr just trying to meet the the minimum to the point where we're even rounding down to 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 the 87 and using moderate income. And maybe the the moderate wording is an oversight. But. Yeah, I think whatever the bylaw is, Greg, which we traditionally have done, and I think um, you know that's usually done with the with the affordable housing consultant. Um, so you know we're happy to meet that. Obviously, we have to meet that requirement, yep. and we will. So yeah, we're not, we're not trying to skirt it. I, and if it came across that way, it was no, no. I mean, quite honestly, the way it's written, you wouldn't be skirting it. It does say low and moderate yeah, yeah. income, but I want to understand that the the. the one, if they're obviously not for a discussion tonight, but when we get to it, but understand one, if there really is a difference under, what do we use, mass uh, CHD actual, HCD actual definitions, but what those definitions are, what the difference is between low and moderate. And uh, I mean, I would, I would like to see if we, if, if we do stay, stick with a um, unit count this high, more of an effort to actually pro provide. I think one of the things that Wakefield is lacking, and we all know this, is a diverse housing stock. Um, and it, so yeah, that, that's my initial comment. Point well taken. We'll talk, um, Jay, I think we can talk to our affordable housing consultant on that. Does that make sense? Yes, yeah, certainly. Yep. I and, think the previous and other projects, sorry, Chip. Um, yeah, no, no, no problem. No, to just real quick to just finish that point. And I think we've had a condition in other sites um, like this that uh, there's a there's a, a preference for Wakefield residents too. So when we get there and that's typically been when they do the, the lottery and such. Um, so we'd be looking for that as well. But anyway, Chip, go ahead. Yeah, uh, Greg mentioned sale. Brian, what's the thought? Isn't this a project that's going to be held by CCNF and it's rental? Uh, I'm going to let Jay address that. I think that's... Correct, but yes, it's it's to be held by CCNF and its partners, and it is a rental project. Okay, so in in that sense, all to our housing count, Brian. Correct me if I'm wrong, but doesn't all the all the units go to our housing count? No, no it's not 40B. Yeah, correct, right? This isn't a 40B chip. Yeah, no, but it's a rental. Correct. But that's only a Mr. Chairman, I, I can speak to that if you'd like. Um, I'm Peter Tam, co-counsel for, for Jay and his team. The, the um, clarification is uh, to Mr. McIntosh's point, this is absolutely gonna comply with Wakefield's requirement for affordable housing available to low and moderate income. There will be local preference to the extent um, um, compliant with law. And uh, it is, uh, a rental project. Um, those 87 units is a, is a very significant um, change in terms of an impact to provide the diversification and affordability that the town is looking for. So when we're talking about a project of scale, those 87 units are effectively subsidized by the market units. Those 87 units count towards the town's subsidized housing inventory. 
the market units do not. So, so understood on that point. My actual point is the presentation said will be available to moderate income. I want to understand if there really is a statutory or regulatory, whatever, difference between low and moderate income. Um, there, there aren't in, in the sense that the, um, they're available to low and moderate income households. There will be a lottery. It will be regulated. Um, DHCD's requirements have to apply here in order for these units to count. Mm -hmm. There'll be a regulatory agreement that is recorded on the property mm -hmm. yep. that, that DHCD has to approve. And um, so when you talk about um, eligibility, eligible households uh, that do not exceed the income limitations based on household size um, uh, will qualify uh, for the lottery. Uh, I would imagine in a, in a project like this, it'll be very popular. And, and obviously what we see in practice, and Jay, you can correct me if I'm wrong, what we see in practice is there is a limited number of, of three bedroom units here. So that's where a lot of the school age impacts are traditionally associated. Uh, and we've kept that down here. Um, however, the uh, typical households in the, in the one or two bedrooms, it's a lot of working class, what you would consider to be uh, more workforce housing. A lot of school teachers, a lot of policemen, um, uh, a lot of municipal uh, workers and, and uh, uh, folks that take advantage uh, of, of the subsidy that is provided. And 87 units is not insignificant uh, in, in, in a town like Wakefield. Yeah, no, we're unfortunately, we're, we're extremely familiar with 40B and where our accounts are. So I think we, we already understand the significance, but it was just very interesting to me that it was almost pointedly said moderate. So I, I, mean, no, I think we can discuss it, you know, but that's just something I want to understand. We didn't intend to, to mislead in any way, but in, in general, they're available for up to moderate income, right? So you, you easily qualify if you're low income uh, and you will still qualify if you're moderate income. Understood. Okay. Point taken. Chip, did you have anything else? Are these um, affordable housing, are they, are they spread out between all three buildings? Yes, there's, yes. there's a requirement that they be dispersed throughout. Okay. And of the 485, I, I, can you just give a unit breakdown? Can somebody? one, two, and three bedroom? I don't think I heard that. No. We have that information. Uh, we, we can certainly provide you. We, we actually have a pretty detailed uh, table and spreadsheet that we could share at a, at a subsequent session. Not affordable, Peter. I'm sorry. No, just the total count. Somebody Allie, must have 45. Could you, Allie, could you please provide just the percentages? Yep. So right now we're looking at about 12% studio units, 57% one bedroom units, 27% uh, two-bedroom units, and 4% three-beds. And I was rounding on the fly, so if that comes out to 101 or 99%, let me know. Okay. We're, we're used to dealing in hard unit counts, not percentages, but um, but I assume your parking calculations take into effect that the three bedrooms require two parking spaces and not yes. one and a half? Yes, that's and, correct. And with, and with that, you still meet it with the ratio you presented? Yes. That's okay. correct. All right, thank you. Hey, Dave, Mr. the chairman. Yes. Well, go ahead, Tom. Mike, well, go ahead, Tom. A couple quick ones. I don't really even need a response tonight, but just trying to initial reaction and maybe lay down a couple of markers. One, I do think it's still too big. Uh, it's a lot of units, a lot of parking spaces for the head of the lake. Uh, appreciate also, it was a comprehensive filing, so I do appreciate there's a lot of good material in there. Um, but, uh, and some good environmental work is being done, but there's also a loss of uh, 18 pretty significant trees, uh, you know, more than 12 inches of caliper and uh, four of them are over 30 inches of caliper. So we're talking about replacing those with two and a half to three and a half inch trees. So I'll be interested in that discussion. And some of those big trees I think are right on the edges of some of where the, the buildings are located. So I wonder, if, uh, I'll be wondering about that as some more trees can be saved by moving some of the buildings. Also be very interested in the traffic, um, given my concern about size and uh, the number of parking spaces. And I took a look at the transportation demand management plan that was included in there. It's pretty weak. 
uh, right now. So we'll be, I'll be looking to, you know, have some further discussions on that. Thank you. Thanks, Tom. Hi, Mr. Chairman, and Mike Feely, one quick question. I, further to Greg's question um, about the affordability to um, low income and moderate income. Uh, for as far as household income goes, what's the percentage of AMI that fits those two categories? 80%. 80% is, is low income. No, 80% is, is moderate income. Low income would typically be 50%. 50% or low. Okay. Anyone else? And we can, Mr. Feely, we, through the chairman, we can, we can go, quantify what that is specifically if you're interested. Okay. Thank you. All right. Anyone else? All right. If anyone else is thinking of comments, I'll just add, uh, it'd be good to get this slide presentation sent to us so we have it for the record. Uh, Brian, as we always like to have copies of the materials presented. Um, it's good. And I'm encouraged to see the, uh, the use of a website to keep uh, any interested parties up to date on the progress of the project. I think we've done it with um, a couple of the projects in town, most recently, I think Tarrant Lane, uh, where we linked it into our town's website, maybe on the Board of Appeals page or somewhere off the, the top, but um, be good to do that. We can follow up with the, the appropriate folks in town hall to do that. I think it'll help uh, folks uh, who are looking for updates. Um, I appreciate what you presented tonight. I know a lot of work has gone into it um, and all the meetings that have taken place before actually filing with this board. Um, I like the overall concept of redeveloping that segment to something much more functional and useful and incorporating elements um, with, the, with the pathway and the public way. Um, I think it hits a lot of the points. I think, I think you know, like the other board members, we got to get into the details a little bit more and understand better how it'll all work. Um, and especially, yeah, traffic and, and so forth. Um, but, you know, I, I like the, the overall concept of redeveloping the site into something much more functional than what's there today. Um, so that's just my initial thought or a couple of thoughts. Um, anyone else before we open it up? Okay, so um, again, for the general public, um, I know someone had reached out to me, Peter Scott, where are you? I'm gonna defer to Peter, he reached out to me the other day. He asked for a couple minutes. Peter, you're yeah, I, I am. There uh, you are. I, so, I'm, I'm so yep, yeah, thank you. So before you get started again, we're gonna try to keep this limited because this is the first of several meetings on this project, obviously. This has been an opening presentation. We'd like to just uh, limit comments and questions to general um, and uh, again, try to avoid repeating. Uh, again, we, we, we can understand there's already concerns about what's going on here, but uh, we'd like to just time box it um, 10, 15 minutes perhaps for initial comments and then uh, as, as you heard, we've got several other hearings after this one. So Peter, I know you wanted to share, you should be able to do that. If you want to still share something or do you just want to speak? Yes, no, I like. I would like to, if I can figure out where it- Down the bottom, there should be a share screen. For yeah, sure. I've got the share, but- um, Share the right thing. <laughs> Planning board. All right. Um, and then once Peter's done, we'll get together there. folks. I see a few other hands up. Can you see me now? We see it. All right. Um, I'll try to make this as succinct and quick as I possibly can. Um, I'm an architect, uh, 25 Avon Street, been in Wakefield since 1970. Uh, my good friend and colleague, Brian Thompson, also an architect and also recently retired as I am, um, got interested in the project when the yard signs started cropping up around town uh, in opposition. Got hold of the, uh, the, the uh, last major design uh, in, in May of last year before the project stalled. And Brian is trained um, as well uh, by Harvard, no less, as an urban designer. And he spent a couple of weeks and he produced a master plan for this whole area. I would like to show you a couple of key pieces of it quickly. Um, there is one particular aspect left from this master plan that we think um, really should be incorporated in this design. I, I might back up and point out that um, it was Brian's work 
and a three hour initial meeting with the two lead people at the Friends of Lake Quantipawit, which eventually started the process of getting them back to the table and got us to where we are today. Um, Brian, let me see, how do I do this? Page down. Uh, his master plan looked at the current site that we're talking about, but it also extended across to the Lakeside Office Park and also to a possible future transit complex down here at the, at the end. Yeah, by the way, uh, it's very interesting to know he did this without knowledge of the uh, 2015 uh, version of the of a master plan of a housing study by Abacus. <laughs> so great minds, I guess. Um, uh, it's a three dimensional study, and it was it was very detailed. As I said, it took us three hours to work our way through it the first time. You're not going to get that here. But this is a view from the east uh, oh, with our side here on the right hand side. Looking from the other direction, here's the, the transit complex. Here would be a possible redevelopment of Lakeside Office Park, which may in fact be coming someplace, someplace down the line. Um, the one issue that I want to address is the pathway. This is the last version of the pathway that I was allowed to have. Um, but you may recognize this from the, from the drawings you have just seen. Um, this plan replicates the circulation of Pontypowat Parkway from the 1957 version, basically. And we think it was a bad idea then, and it's a bad idea now. The, uh, the diversion of the road around the back of the site like this was done at that time because the front of uh, American Mutual was placed on this side of the building facing the highway so that they showed the highway their, their best face. When you saw the pictures that Ali showed earlier, looking from this side, it was clearly the rear end of the building, and that's what's looking towards the lake. Um, so in any event, uh, if you look at the two variations, this is where it is now, and I've tilted this around with north at the upside, uh, at top of the drawing, but it's the same site. Brian's master plan strongly proposes that Quantum Howard Parkway follow a route more appropriate to its name as a parkway and that it continues straight across the site here and that um, feeds into the site and be treated as driveways separately without through traffic going on it. But the main, any through traffic be diverted across at this point. This has the advantage if that were to be done to provide a much stronger um, difference between or, or separation between the privately owned residential properties here and the publicly owned um, park space. Now, if you think of park spaces in general, think of major ones in your mind, and I bet you every single one of them is surrounded by roads, starting with Central Park in New York City, uh, the Boston Common and Public Gardens, Wakefield, uh, public commons. Imagine the upper common in Wakefield without, without Main Street going through. And the lawn just goes up against the buildings there, maybe a pathway. The whole feel of that space would be completely different. And that's what will happen here too, in our opinion. If in fact the road is allowed to curl around the back of the site, um, people still cut through here, including a number of people from the Friends of Lake Quantapau, so they know about that. Um, we uh, we grant that doing this makes the site a little bit more attractive for through traffic, but there are a number of tools um, that can be used to slow that down and control it. There's also, by the by, a section of the master plan which addresses, as I said earlier, the Lakeside Office Park. This is a view from the north looking down towards the lake. This is Quantipowered Parkway here. And the proposal is that if that site gets developed, that we start thinking now about the notion of separating the new built environment here as well from new public lands in large green spaces, about four, uh, four and a half acres of it, alongside the lake, which will be then part of a, a walkway system that could continue all the way along next to the lake and not have people walk all the way up and down the west side of Lake Wanapawad 
uh, along uh, North Avenue. Um, that's as fast as I can go. <laughs> There's a lot more detail to this if anybody's interested at some point. Thank you, Peter. We appreciate the, uh, the input. All right, uh, the next hand I saw, I think, go up was Chris Kroon. So please, uh, you can unmute yourself and just state your name and address for the record, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My name is Christopher Crone uh, at 114 Main Street. And thank you uh, to the board tonight for, for uh, the opportunity to speak. Uh, I'm a longtime member of this community. My home at 114 Main Street looks directly out upon uh, 200 Lake Corner Power uh, the development. I'm also a, a member of the Friends of Lake Corner Power. Um, however, I stand in strong opposition to this development. Uh, I want to address some comments that we heard uh, tonight briefly uh, and some that we didn't. Uh, first, with respect to the comments in the presentation, let's be clear. This is not a community-based project intended to address the housing needs or low-income housing uh, needs of our community. This is about a business developer who sees an opportunity to make money for himself and his shareholders and nothing more. And to be clear, there is no shortage of unaffordable housing in our community or the surrounding communities. Okay, Mr. McGrail's reference to the now expired Wakefield Housing Production Plan um, was a bit off point. Um, putting aside whether it's valid at this point or not, it is expired. The language that Mr. McGrail pointed to expressly contemplates residential developments in areas removed from the lakeside neighborhood. Okay, to, to imply that this is no, uh, you uh, haven't gotten to this is a suggestion know, that she's told me to excuse me that right. this is this is a um, a production plan that would suggest that development should occur in this neighborhood. Uh, I believe is a misstatement. Uh, Mr. D'Amico described the project as reasonable and conservative in size. Respectfully, this is simply tone deaf. This would be one of the largest developments in our town period. It's of no surprise that none of the images that we saw tonight from this presentation was a, was a perspective view from Main Street or the town common of the development, something intended to capture the, the size and height of this development. Okay, And that is despite having requested this, that perspective view several times in negotiations with the friends. Uh, in the cons conservation land, that uh, they proposed a grant to the town is no compromise at all. This is wetlands. It's absolutely worthless to CCNF. They can't build upon it, it has no value. Um, and the giant covered parking garage that they propose is not an increase to impervious ground considerations, right? This is, this, this is the opposite. It's a giant parking garage. It's, it's not impervious to, the, to, to groundwater. Don't be fooled. These arguments simply carry no weight. A few of the issues that we didn't hear tonight. Disruption. There's a word we didn't hear at all. Disruption to our town with a project of this size, particularly at a time when our businesses are trying desperately to recover from this pandemic could be devastating. During the construction, which could take years, Parking and lake access would be substantially impaired. The noise and impact of the construction equipment blocking the pathway around the lake would be unavoidable. And after construction, the public access would be forever reduced. This does not increase public access. This property as it stands now is a staging ground for countless walks, runs, community events that in any normal year would occur virtually every weekend. These events are just now starting to return to our community. And this development threatens to eliminate this very important public function. And the light and noise pollution of development of this size right on the shores of our lake would be blinding. Can we bring it to some closure, Mr. Crane, please? We've sure. Got Please. Thank you. Uh, you know, I, I think at this point they haven't attempted to address the burden on our schools, the roads and congestion around the lake. I understand that, that may come at a later point, but certainly 
um, is, is a uh, substantial concern of a development of this uh, size. Um, and finally, I just note that the town has just completed its uh, re-election process. And several of our town officials ran on platforms promising to reduce overdevelopment in our town. Several had the ideas similar to ours uh, to create a recreational space on this land that the whole town could use. Now, these are not just off the cuff ideas. They reflect the thoughts and opinions of our town people themselves. These goals are possible. And if we give them a chance to succeed. So in short, I'd, I'd urge the board to deny the request. Let's see how, many, how the many other housing developments that are already under construction in the town satisfy the housing needs before allowing this development to ruin what could be the greatest natural asset our town has to offer. Thank you. I look forward to future hearings on this. Thank you. Uh, Peter, your hands up again, but I think uh, we got to move on to other folks. Uh, Rada? Can you unmute yourself, Rada? Okay, I'm unmuting myself. Hello. Hi. 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 Um, thank you so much. Um, I, um, I own a business downtown and I, as I was interested in different aspects about this project and asking uh, questions, but um, something came to my attention. Uh, the pathway up front where current pathway for the, you know, where we are walking and, and potential biking. Um, somebody suggested, a, a gentleman before this suggested that that should be a roadway, that would be a catastrophe to have a roadway right along the lake by the water and preventing people to enjoy the view in the lake. And, and um, it, it would be just a catastrophe for this project, but please don't do it. And uh, the uh, roadway that goes around the project is just fine. But my question is the pathway in front of the lake, would that accommodate a bike path? Because just because we don't have a clear bike path currently around the lake, that does not mean that we will not have it in the future. So I think the project developer should consider that that uh, pathway in front of the lake that should be a lot uh, wide enough to accommodate uh, jogging, um, walking, and uh, potential bike uh, bike path. Also, something else that came to my to attention: a lot of greenery and a lot of upkeep. Uh, in the future you're going to have. And I'm concerned about what type of product and pesticides, what type of things they will use in order to, to maintain that lush development look residential that everybody wants, but this is along the lake. And I'm concerned about in the future, whether that project will have a, a, a company that a management company that can change over time and who knows what they can use so this is something concerned for me being this close. Uh, it does not have to be answered right now, but I just wanted to raise that as a potential and make sure that we, we are clear what they will be using to maintaining the, uh, the uh, greenery around the project. So that's sort of what it came to me uh, uh, right now. And um, I also um, wanted to ask, I hear a lot of about cafe but I also read that there's a restaurant. So I'm confused about the mixed use. What will this project have? For instance, I am, um, tonight I'm here uh, in a few business uh, uh, people, business friends that are asked me to be here to ask some of these questions. They're interested in perhaps owning a business in that project, perhaps opening a restaurant there, perhaps uh, whatever that is. And my question is, how many of those, would there be any retail? Would there be any like a gift shop? Would there be a, a restaurant? How, what, how big of a capacity that restaurant would be? Uh, what, that's something that I would like to hear that in the future, whether that's tonight or not. And um, I actually- um, 20 seconds, please, Rana. 
Okay, I have one more thing, because if we're going to build a project like this, I would like to have some type of a connection from that project I talked past that could be like a bike rental, um, a shuttle, so that that people can use that uh, from the, the residents in that complex that can be used in, in use our downtown, thus helping our businesses like myself and other restaurants versus just becoming a bedroom community. So I think something that project should have some type of a, you know, bike rentals or shuttling or some type of that they truly are connected to the community, to downtown, to help our business and not hurt us. And okay. I do like to uh, hear more about what type of a mixed use they're planning to use. Thank okay. you. Thank you, Rada. Bronwyn, Galavope. Uh, good evening. And thank you for having a public input on this. Um, for those of you who know me, you may be shocked that I am almost speechless on this. I, I want it on record that at, I hope that Cabot Cabot and Forbes understands the vast majority of Wakefield re residents do not like and do not want this project. I echo uh, Mr. Crone. Um, this is a slow motion assault, not only on our lake, but on our community. Uh, Cabot, Cabot and Forbes may do some nice work, but they are urban developers. We are not urban, we are suburban. This will be a catastrophe, um, not only for our lake and those who live around it, but I believe to the town, it will change the fundamental character and timber of our community. When I first saw the pictures of the renderings this evening, my mouth literally fell open. That is a complex, an urban complex that you would see in Boston and Cambridge. All of the nice words, the promises, the pretty packaging, we all know, let's acknowledge, is only just to sell um, uh, this enormous, sprawling, oversized, well of a project that will, no matter what anyone says, impact our schools, our roads, and God help us, do not put a road on the, on the edge of the lake, please. I think that at the very, very least, Cabot, Cabot and Fords needs to go back and rethink this because the town of Wakefield does not want them here with 485 units is appalling. Thank you. Thanks, Bronwyn. Carl, Dunlap. Welcome, Carl. Hello, Carl Dunlap, 18 King Street in Wakefield. I'm also a uh, business owner at the, at the Lakeside uh, Office Park, which is right next to Honeydew Donuts, so right in the same neighborhood as well. Um, I guess my biggest concern here is, you know, we looked at the history of this site and it's, you know, always been a business. It's in what's called a limited business district. I didn't realize the term limited business means to limit the amount of business and put in residential because uh, 485 units of residential going in somewhere where there's zero residents today uh, seems a little bit um, changing the character of that property, which I guess is why uh, you need a special permit to, uh, to allow that. Um, I also am concerned about the lack of uh, uh, places for business in Wakefield. So if this site goes to 485 residential units and one restaurant, which is a percentage of 0.2%, so 99.8 residential development and 0.2% business, I think that's kind of a joke to call that mixed use, but whatever, um, you never get that back. And that affects our tax base. So to the question of the financial impact, I think that's important. The businesses pay a higher tax rate. Uh, the residential use more services, obviously. Uh, so I am concerned about that and the size of that development. Um, also, um, I guess I just wanna understand when I look up this property, I see that uh, the on the board of the uh, assessor's site, it's owned by Waterstone Wakefield LLC. I just want to understand the relationship uh, with Waterstone Wakefield and Cabot Cabot and Forbes. Um, my guess is that Cabot and Cabot and Forbes has a PNS agreement to 
to uh, purchase this conditional upon a granting of, of a permit for uh, midsize and uh, garden style apartments. And if that doesn't happen, I would want to know what, uh, you know, what Cabot Cabot and Forbes would do. Would they walk away from it? Uh, would Wakesto Wakefield, uh, Waterstone Wakefield still own the property? So I may be totally wrong on that, but I'd like some clarification from, you know, one of the many attorneys on the call about that. And um, yeah, that's, uh, that's really, I have uh, so the, the history of it. I also wanted to point out that wasn't, wasn't mentioned in the history that I think the Zoning Board of Appeals uh, had a meeting that approved this for lab space at one point, and that wasn't mentioned. So I think this was marketed as a corporate, corporate campus and was approved for lab space. That seemed to be kind of glanced over and gone straight into uh, residential. So uh, I would encourage the board to deny a permit uh, in this case because it's just not the right use for the property. Thank you. Well, to, to one of your points, yes, uh, Waterstone was the previous applicant that the board granted permits to for its R&D and office use. And are they still the current owner? I would have to defer to Attorney McGrail or the team. Hi, it's Jay Doherty. Uh, we have a contract to acquire the site. Waterstone is the current owner. And uh, at this time, our plan is to work with the town to complete and approval for the project and to then acquire the site. Is that contract conditional on approval for residential or would you do something if it was business? Um, I don't think it's appropriate to get into the details yeah. of the contract. I, I, I would say that um, a couple of things about the prior approval. One, I, I would point out that the prior approval uh, grants uh, that proposed project the ability to do 600 parking spaces, all of which would be at grade. One of the big differentiators here, there is somewhat more parking, obviously, but it's a 15 or $20 million investment to put a garage in place. And we think that's important to the health of the recharge of the water and to the visual impact of the project. The, the second thing is it, it's, it's uncertain as to whether the existing building is truly suitable for reuses lab. The, the life sciences community has changed its physical requirements of buildings quite a bit. Um, there are about a third of the life sciences market now looks to make uh, what's called GMP manufacturing of drugs. And that typically requires a, a greater proportion of the space to be taller, perhaps as tall as 30 feet high. Uh, and that's what's being undertaken increasingly for life sciences. So we're not very certain as to whether or not the project could be devoted to life sciences, uh, whether or not if the town uh, denies a project outright for residential, um, it would revert to that use is so uncertain I couldn't comment on. Thank you. I, I, I realize everybody likes the idea of re redevelopment. I think I encourage that as well. I just... Uh my personal opinion would be redevelopment as a commercial space. And I do know GMP environments and I work in them and work with Fortune 1000 companies that build them and it could be redeveloped for that as well. So I appreciate that, thank you. Thanks, Carl. Okay, and the last hand I see up, uh, Julie Scott's iPhone. Hi there, this is Julie Scott's iPhone. I'm, I'm watching another meeting, so I don't want you to see me because I've got another computer with another Wakefield meeting going on behind me. Um, I just want to say this is just overly large to put such a dense population um, living spaces on our lake. Um, for every 200 cars that you put in that area, it equals one mile of traffic. And with what we have now, it's um, almost three miles worth of traffic. If you look at what they've got projected, it's probably more than three miles of traffic added to our community. Um, as a teacher, I know that schools rely on the taxes that business comes in, and I'm concerned about losing this as a business space for Wakefield. Um, this is something larger than what we have down on Audubon Road. Unfortunately, um, why we, I don't understand why putting the, one of the largest um, units Wakefield has ever had on the lake is such a good idea. Um, it's, I wish it had been on Audubon Road that we had thought of putting the large stuff and putting the smaller stuff that we find on Audubon Road, maybe on the lake, but it's too late to go back. Um, Right now, um, when it's in use, right now it's not, um, during the day there's business and the people leave and they go home at night. If we had people living there, our lakeside area would have those people living there walking as pedestrians, um, more traffic on our roads. You're talking about um, 
hundreds and hundreds of cars trying to get downtown. Um, we, we are not talking about expanding um, downtown areas to park. Um, we already have an issue, a supposed issue with parking. Um, I don't know how this would help out. And I've been to almost all of the meetings that were available to FOLQ. And I know they've talked about shuttles and have biking and stuff like that. It's, it's, I don't, I, I don't believe any of that. Um, I'm really worried about our, our community and the quality of life in Wakefield if we add this and what it could possibly do to our schools as well. Thank you. You're Julie, just for the record, I'm sorry, I forgot to capture your, your address, please. I'm 226 Main Street, Wakefield, right on Thank the lake. You. Yeah, thank, thank you. you, just for the record. Thank you. I see one more hand, I'm gonna entertain that and then we'll close with a public testimony for the evening. RS, you're gonna to have to state your name and address for the record. Uh, yeah, hi, uh, uh, Rick Stewart, 157 Salem Street. Uh, I have a quick question. Uh, I watched a planning board meeting the other night and they made a um, statement that for this site, there's gonna require a four foot high extension uh, a fill for the entire site as part of this process. Is that true? The entire site has to be raised four feet? I can speak to that. That's not true. There's fill going in in certain areas of the site. Um, we're about you know six inches to a foot above the existing buildings uh, grade. How many, how many truckloads of fill would it require to complete that process? I can't necessarily speak to that right now, but I, I can get back to you on that. Hundreds? I, I probably wouldn't say hundreds, but I, you know, we'd have to look at that analysis, but you know, we're looking at, you know, on average, like six to one, six inches to a foot above what the current building is at. Thank you. Appreciate it. Um, but I'm just going to reiterate, like many other people said here, you know, I, I believe this it's an inappropriate development for that area. For all the reasons stated, especially again, more reduction in business community areas. We're seeing it all around town. Places that were traditionally for businesses are being converted now to residential. You know, at some point we have to stop and have a balance. So my one recommendation is, I believe the plant, the um, zoning board should just enforce all the current regulations. Don't provide any variances at this point. Uh, you know, let them develop based off of what the zoning currently allows, and don't provide any additional relief going forward for this project. Thank you very much for your time. Appreciate it. All right. Thank you, Mr. Stewart. Um, okay. So with that, we'll and close. Mr. The, the Mr. Chairman, you. before yeah, I'll go ahead. Before you, before you close it, I'd like to know if Mr. Kroon was speaking on behalf of FOLQ. He certainly seemed to make that point that he was a member and speak and had a pretty good speech going. So was he representing FOLQ? And if not, I'd love to hear from. Mr. Conley, who I think is the president of FOQ, because all I keep kept hearing through everything before they got to us is that they've been dealing with FOLQ. So I'd like to not have misrepresentations or find out if bills are available. Well, this is this is Chris Crow to be absolutely clear. I was not representing the Friends of Lake Corner Pilot. I'm representing myself and my wife, my family. Okay, great. I'm your member. first statement was you were a member of it and you were against it. So I am back in fine. Order. Okay, great. I just wanted to know if you were speaking on behalf Mr. Hatfield, of can, uh, can you recognize me uh, just for a brief statement? Uh, Bill Conley, 83 Elm Street. Um, I will, Bill. As Chip has asked, and we will entertain that. Please go ahead. Can you just thank, thank you, you Mr. Chair. Good evening, everybody. Uh, I'm glad Chris uh, cleared that up. Uh, our involvement in this project uh, has been substantial. Uh, and I will be brief. Uh, we went from opposition to uh, agreeing uh, with the project. We were looking at certain things. Uh, we weren't uh, looking at an extended agenda. We were looking at lake issues and the importance of water quality, conservation, improving and increasing parkland and reasonable dimensions and footprints. And I think they're part of the plan that Cabot and Cabot is presenting tonight. Uh, I, think, I think the plan uh, certainly uh, it needs to be looked at relative to uh, additional issues affecting the town, but uh, we are in support of it because it does address our core issues given that development uh, and the zoning and the likelihood of alternatives to residential not really presenting itself and no existing plan in place 
to do anything that others would uh, imagine could be work there like recreational space uh, that we, uh, we are close to agreeing with Cabot and Cabot Forbes. Uh, and I think you'll see a lot of what we're talking about and agreeing in the plan when it is, as it is submitted. Uh, so that's our statement tonight. I can, I'm speaking for the board of the Friends of Lake Quantum Pilot. And we'll be happy to answer any other questions in subsequent meetings as well. Okay, thank you, Bill. Thank you, guys. Appreciate the clarification. Okay. All right, back to the board. So um, I think Brian had put up briefly. Brian, do you want to? Yeah, if I could, if I could just address one thing, Mr. Chair, quickly. Sure. And then if you can put your slide back up there. Yeah. Can I share the screen? Sure. And then we'll just go on to our next step. And I just want to reference this because Mr. Kroon made a comment that I won't say he said I made a misrepresentation, but there might have been a misunderstanding. This is the housing production plan that I referenced. This is the North Ave at 128 District, highlighted in orange, Lakeside Transit Oriented Development. You can see that our property is right in the middle of that. When you look at the comment that Mr. Kroon made, let's go to the language. It states, much of this district is removed from the Lakeside neighborhood and could accommodate mid-rise or even low high-rise buildings. Didn't say it should be, it said it is. And when you look at the plan, here's your residential neighborhood that shows on this plan. Our property is the farthest one from it. So it's, it's, an estate, it's a statement of fact in this report. It's not a statement of qualification. So I just wanted to point that out. Thank you. Okay. So agenda, I assume we're gonna get into the architectural and design and massing where we usually start at the next meeting. And the team will be prepared to do that, Brian? We will. Okay, and closing remarks, board members, before we continue this. Mr. Chair, very quick. I noticed Brian had the economic impact kind of discussion, study, whatever, pretty late in the um, uh, chronology. One suggestion or, or question would be, should we move that earlier? Because that could really affect kind of the massing, the sizing, not necessarily the architecture, but um, you know, based on how many people are, how many units, uh, you know, affect town services and stuff like that. It, it looked to me like it was going to be one of the last things discussed. And I think it really should almost be flip-flopped. Yeah. And, and, and Greg, I, if, Al, you want to put up the list because I didn't mean to put it up as an order. I was just oh, okay. Okay. Listing yeah. the items. So, I mean, and that's a, a point, Matt, can you, can you give an update of where we are with the economic report when we'll be ready to submit that? I think it's pretty close, right? Yeah, so we have a fiscal impact study, which will be in a position to uh, circulate with the town next week. So we can get to it pretty quick, Greg. Okay. And then my question would be, you know, the other comments we heard tonight is, you know, three miles of traffic, the usual rhetoric about something this big, which is, you know, legitimate. Um, so when it, where are you at with transportation and traffic? So I, I figured that would come up. So I, we, we've submitted everything to the Traffic Advisory Committee, Town's Peer Review Consultant. I reached out to Lieutenant Anderson, the chair of the TAC today, and I said, any idea when the TAC might meet on this? I suspect the Board of Appeals may ask this evening. Um, not rushing, just want a rough idea to report. And he reported back. He said, I'm trying to set up a meeting for the month of May. As soon as I can, I'll be in touch. So that was a response. Yeah, so I'm I'm in agreement with everybody else, Mr. or with Greg, that economics should push up to the front, keep traffic to the front, um, you know, but certainly start with that architectural and design, and kind of understand massing at that same point in, of time. Makes sense. Good suggestion, Greg. Okay. So. Um, I don't know if we'd be prepared to do that all in one meeting, just in the interest of time, but maybe architectural next meeting. We spent some time on that. And would you be ready to do our economic as part of that or maybe the following meeting in May? Uh, I, Mr. Chair, I also have another suggestion. We can already see that the amount of interest from the town is great. Um, and given the amount of other things we have during normal meetings, 
you know, I'm kind of not in favor of staying up till midnight every two weeks because at some point our brains go a little soft. Um, it might make some sense to do special meetings for this project on a special night where it's just this topic. I mean, even tonight, I, I don't know exactly what time it is, but I think we we'll spent about two and a half hours on it. Uh, or we will by the end. So just a thought, just a thought. And maybe we can start with architectural and see how it goes in one of our morning uh, normal meeting nights. But I, I feel there's going to be two, two and a half hours of discussion every time this, this unit comes up on whatever topic it is. Okay. Just my gut. We can do that. Well, let's discuss it at the next meeting. Um... So that, yeah, we can we can move things along if the team is prepared to get into certain topics, several topics. We can have special meetings on this. We just have to announce them and notice. Yeah, um, but it's certainly doable. Absolutely. Um, okay. Anything that would else? just be a thought. If other, I, you know, we can discuss it, but it's a thought I had. It's just in the interest of time. I don't want to discuss it tonight. <laughs> yeah. No. It's been about an hour and a half, I think, uh, but. Uh, on this specific one, but anyway. Um, all right, with that, I would uh, entertain a motion to uh, continue. So is that until, the, this, what's the specific date on that, Mr. Chair? May, May 12th. 12th, I believe. So continue to May 12th at 7 p.m.? Yes. Okay. I move that we continue to May 12th at 7 p.m., Mr. Chair. I'll second. Thank you, any discussion? All right, uh, I'm in favor, Chip. Yes. Tom? Yes. Jim? Yes. Joe? Yes. Greg? Yes. Mike? Yes. And I think Amy has stepped out. Okay. With that, we are continued. Um, thanks, team, for the initial presentation. We'll, we'll talk to you in a couple of weeks. Thank you. Thank you. <sighs> There's a couple more hearings there, Jim. <laughs> I, heard, I, I heard that young. <laughs> Moving right along. The next new hearing, 21-53, Michael Mormino. Hopefully I pronounced that correctly, at 218 Vernon Street. That's me. And you got it right. All right. Thank <laughs> you. Welcome. Okay. All right. So you're representing uh, yourselves this evening? I, nope. I actually have somebody from the contractor here to speak on my behalf. Okay. Um, Tracy Sharkey. Good evening, Mr. Chairman and the board, Tracy Sharkey, 14 West Street, Douglas, Mass. We are here tonight requesting a special permit with respect to a continuation and extension of a non-conforming use to raise and replace the single story structure and increase to one and a half stories. So we are holding the side setback line as shown on the plot plan submitted. And you have something, excuse me, ma'am. Can you share or can the applicant share a, uh, a copy of the plan? Yep. In one second. Yep. Um, so approximately 50% of the proposed new garage height will be uh an increase in the non-conformity. The other 50% is within the envelope. So let me just find the application. Okay. Yeah, I think mainly we'd be looking at the plot plan initially if you have that. And Yep, I will. Yeah. We'll need to go to architecturals if the board members want to go there, but at least the plot plan to give everyone a, a stance visually. You know, okay. For those members of the public. Okay. Okay. 
Okay, so here we have the plot of the land. Um, it is a non-conforming lot with only 92 feet of frontage. The location of the existing house and the existing single story uh, kind of in rough shape garage is cited on here, remove and demolish. Um, and we are proposing um, in the gray actually shown on here uh, for the replacement. So you can see the setback line and approximately half, this back half would be the increase in nonconformity. This portion would be within the setback. So the, the proposed garage would be proportional to the existing home there. Um, and I think um, the five letters of su support were submitted to the board. So uh, I don't believe there was any objections on the direct abutters. Uh, so I can answer any other questions. Um, the proposed new garage would be up to building code. It would be aesthetically more pleasing than the um, existing garage. So I think it would be an improvement and um, they would be able to park two cars in. It's gonna be a single door, 20 foot wide. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Ms. Sharkey. Um, so you, you've applied for a special permit, but 190.50 is usually findings. Correct. So there was a concern that because of the increase of the height, the board may want to um, issue a special permit for the intensifying of the existing nonconformity, but would find that it's not more detrimental than the existing. Belt and suspenders. Right. No, it's just yeah. Normally, normally, if there's multiple aspects to a project, there'd be a filing of a special permit and maybe a finding or a variance in a finding. Normally, you don't have a special permit and a finding all in one application. Gail, does this ring a bell with you? Did did they consult with the building department on this? We They probably did, but we don't advise on, um, you know, what forms of relief. They're okay. presenting themselves. And yeah, that's the one area we don't go into. Okay. Like just wondering this. if they did. Because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. I'm not sure. I just if if the board would need to grant a special permit in addition to making the finding. Dave, this goes along to what what we do. And Greg, correct me if I'm wrong, but this is the the you know what we normally do is finding that it's a continuation of the nonconformity, and if we find that it increases the nonconformity, that it's not any more detrimental to the neighborhood. And isn't that the belt and suspenders part A, part B that we normally do? I think that's what we normally do. And I apologize, my hand was up. I don't even know how I did that. I did not mean to. If that's why you called on me, Chad. No, I called on you because you're our lawyer. Okay, just making sure. So, well, yeah, I'm not you your. To, you have to, you have to start Hold on. having that rule sometime. As Brian can probably let you know, I now have to. I am not your lawyer. <laughs> I am a lawyer. A lawyer. A lawyer. Um, no, I, I would agree. I think that's what we normally do. <laughs> See what an answer that was. <laughs> On the other hand, because they, I guess I don't even understand what the application for the special permit is for, because that's what we normally do. It doesn't can make we, any sense to me. Can we, without an application for it, the finding? Can we make the finding instead of issuing a special permit? So if I may, Mr. Chairman. Yes. So I did apply under Article 9, Section 190-50. The only hesitation was the intensifying of the height. So I am creating a new nonconformity where there is not one at this moment. That's why I had requested the special permit for that back piece where I'm not holding the height. Understood. I'm just not sure um, if a special permit's required. Our 19050B in this case, I don't think it goes to A because that's a that's a single or two-family structure. This is a pre-existing non-conforming building structure or use, and I would call this a building being an accessory building to the uh, prop on the property may be changed, extended or altered, provided that it 
um, will be permitted unless we make a finding that such change shall not be more so not be substantially more detrimental um, than the existing nonconformity. So um, both prongs don't necessarily come into play with one. Just the one. Just the one. Um, and, and where they're increasing the height but keeping the same footprint, um, that's what we would have to consider, whether that increase in height um, would be substantially more detrimental. And if it weren't, I think we can make the finding without a special permit, even though the application is sort of mixed. Um, um, anyway, if anyone have any other comments, questions? Just to clarify, question? though, it is not keeping the same footprint, right? There's the extension you said, the 50% extension? Of height. So the footprint is actually expanding, but yep. it's expanding within the allowed setback. So I can pull up the plan again. Yeah. If you can, because I, sure. I thought that's what I read or heard, that it was same footprint, just different height. No, it's not the same footprint. It is, it's actually getting larger. So we're increasing on the left side, looking into the property. So you have the hatch line right here. You have the existing garage right here. Here's an arrow and it only extends to this point. It's just a one car. So we're, but we're extending within the setbacks. There's a little spot right there. Right, okay, my bad. So- No, that's okay. Right, normally Dave, we have a situation where it goes to the side yard or something else, but that, that non-conformity is not increasing. The only non-conformity that I see is increasing, which isn't really a non-conformity because there's no height, the height limitation isn't being exceeded. Um, I, yeah, I, I don't see the special permit and So the increase in the height is sometimes considered an intensification on that back portion within the, the required setback. But so, I did yeah, I can see how you can think that, but I don't think we would I, I personally would not see it that way. But but either way, if it is, it's still 190 50 B. And we just have that one prong finding the extension or alteration shall not be substantially more detrimental to the existing non conforming use. Substantial. Yeah. Yeah. But either way, in what, whatever we find, I'm not advocating. Yeah. This yeah. It's just, I, the, it's I, just I don't, the I don't see it as substantial. Yeah. You know, it, it would, if you put in a second story on it, then I might consider it. But this is just, reconfiguring a roof so that you've got sort of an attic in it. <coughs> storage. Storage, right. And I did leave it open-ended just to do the 150-50 on the application. Yep. Does the board wanna see the architectural plans? Sure. Okay. Just give me one second. In the meantime, I'm just checking checking the bylaw myself. Just okay. Mr. Chair, could
could I even ask, wasn't there something recently where this happened again? And I don't want to put Brian on the spot, but I may. Um, where, and I think it was, again, not one of his clients, but he pointed out that, I, I want to say it was this, that we could make the finding of our own kind of motion rather than actually what the application said. Correct. I can't find the language that he was, I can't, I want to say it was the same thing but I can't find the actual language at the moment. <laughs> He's not gonna answer you. Yeah, he doesn't care. <laughs> <laughs> He's in another room, feeding his dog. He's recovering from the last hearing. <laughs> yeah, I didn't wanna make it difficult for you guys after that, you needed a break. <laughs> I would be, and I'm sure the applicant would be amenable to uh, um, a, just a determination or a finding from the board. Um, essentially, that's what special permits do anyway. Um, so you're not necessarily making any, um, you know, precedent setting decisions. So I would be amenable to that if that's what the board, um, which direction the board wants to go in. Yeah, I mean, again, if, if, if we feel we're doing the right thing and, and just granting the finding, if, if it were to do that, um, A, you know, if it were to be appealed, would it stand up if, if, we, if all the full relief that may have been required wasn't granted? Um, or if there's future problems on the road with the property, it tends to be sold, there's a title problem because there was some relief that uh, should have been there that wasn't grandfathered or wasn't part of the, um, the title or deed So because um, everything gets registered. So... We just want to make sure we're doing our due diligence. I, I, I'm leaning that way as well. We're just making sure. Okay. But, uh, and are you attorney yourself? I'm sorry if I missed that. No, I'm not. You're the architect or the? Um, I work for Guaranteed Builders. Oh, for okay. Actor. Okay. Right. Uh, board members, I, I, I think I'm there with, with a finding here. Um, Does the board want to see any other pictures? So this is the portion. So we're at about 13 feet. So the existing building is about this height. So the back portion, which is here, would be the non-conforming area. All right, so from a height perspective, some intensification because that, that corner is near the lot line. Correct. And already known to them. Yeah, yeah. Understood. Tracy, do you have a, a, a before picture of what you have there right now? It might be good to show that. Yes. One moment. So I'll show you all my emails that are unanswered. <laughs> <laughs> And, we, and the board certainly appreciates why you're doing that to the applicant that uh, you did speak to your neighbors and, and get their input. Not everyone knows that and it's important, I think, for whether it's a finding or a variance or whatever, that you let your neighbors know what you're thinking of doing and get, you know, try to address any concerns before you come here. So uh, kudos for doing that. And it's good to hear the neighbors are in support. That's helpful. Wonder what that existing building was used for. It has a chimney and Back in the day, that thing's probably rather old, right? There used to be a, there used to be a greenhouse, and that was attached to the greenhouse. Dave, you must drive by it every day, right? Okay, so board, we have right here the garage. You can see the proposed garage will be uh, in the likeness of the existing house roof, but sh much shorter. This is the condition. I can certainly see why the neighbors were in support. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, here's another side view. Mm. Rear view. And another close up. This question is the fence yours or theirs? It's close to that garage. 
Um, we're not really sure, but whatever happens, we'll be re replacing it, and we're in, we're coordinating with all the neighbors about that. Okay, because yeah. it looked like from that back picture that it may not have been the the sturdiest it, <laughs> back there. And yeah, it's split up. They're actually in the control. process of re they're in the process of rebuilding that right now. We're kind of split up with them right now in terms of getting that all taken care of. Okay. And it does appear to be right on the lot line. Shown on this right here. Yeah. The existing stockade fence. Down to the granite bound. Okay. All right, thank you for that. Any other comments, questions, board members? Uh, CONCOM uh, reviewed it and said they had no concerns, not within their jurisdiction, fire departments, um, no objections, no concerns. So just for the record, we did hear from those two town boards. If nothing else at this time, we can certainly open up the public testimony. If anyone has a comment or question, please raise your hand in the Zoom meeting. I will call on you. Going once, going twice. All right, seeing no hands, we'll close with the public testimony. Back to the board. The only thing I need, Dave, is the name of the site plan. It was Metro West, but I didn't see what the date was. Uh, Northwest Engineering, 222, right? I think that's what I can see, 222. Yeah. Um, and then the architecturals as uh, GBI 23 2021. Right. You got it. Yeah. So, Mr. Chair, I move that we find under 190 50 B that uh, given the site plan from Northwest Engineering dated 2 22 2021 presented this evening and the architectural plans from GBI dated 2 3 2021 that the uh, proposed project, that we find that the pro proposed project as presented to us this evening is not uh, any more detriment, is not, although there is an increase to the nonconformity, it is no more detrimental to the neighborhood. Substantially more detrimental. What? It is not substantially more detrimental. It's not substantially more detrimental. Just wanna make that clear, thank you. Yeah, um, sorry. No worries. I'll second that. Thank you. Any discussion on the motion? Um, just, I just um, ran out to check um, some paperwork that I had on filing for a similar sort of garage at my house. And you are on track because what I filed for was 190-50B. That's all. And that was approved at the time in 07. OK. Thanks, just an Jim. FYI, basically. Thank you. Can I rethink that vote? <laughs> <laughs> All right. So uh, again, Amy is in here, one of our regular voting members. Um, so it'll be myself, Jim, Chip, Joe, and Tom who seconded the motion. Um, all in favor? Chip? Aye. Tom? Aye. Jim? Aye. Joe? Aye. And I vote in favor. So that is unanimous. Okay. So you have your finding. Um, Normally the attorneys representing uh, clients would uh, probably draft something, but seeing you have none, I'll, I'll draft the decision. I'll get it out to you. If you can, uh, Gail, do we have their emails already? If not. Um, yes, I believe I do. I have guaranteed builders, I believe, don't I? Yes, you do. Yes, and I okay. can draft something up if you wanted me to email it over to you and you can a revise it. I'm sorry? Drafting a decision? Yeah. Okay, if you want to do that, just yeah. send it to Gail. She'll forward it on and I'll, I'll look it over and make any updates. And, okay. And um, we'll get it filed. As, and um, and if you can, just include um, the electronic copies of the plans that you shared tonight that were part of the application. Yeah. Uh, we just like to have electronic copies along with the paper ones. Yep, I believe um, we sent Gail the entire application electronic, but I'll just double check that with my office. Yeah, no, you need to resend that, yeah. Oh, okay, all right. Okay. Thanks. No problem. All right, 
Thank you. Thank you very much, board. Have a great night. Thank you. Good luck to you. Thank you. All right. Good luck. Um, next case is 21 54, 55, 56, and 57, Albion Street Reborn LLC, 13 to 15 Albion Street. Mr. Penny, I believe, is the applicant. Yes, Mr. Chen. Right. Can you hear me? I can. Um, I just have some questions here. I'm looking over the file, what you've applied for here, what you're thinking of doing. I guess board members, I, I do have some questions about whether the applicant has actually filed um, all the proper, for all the proper relief here. Um, and I'm wondering if we open the hearing or we discuss uh, maybe my concerns, if anyone else had, has similar ones, uh, because if we do that, then the, the applicant may have to refile and we would have to either, you know, just continue the hearing and until such time that any such deficiencies, again, if I'm, if I'm correct, um, are corrected um, rather than getting into the details without having all of the uh, proper applications in front of us. Um, so, so, Mr. Chairman, I don't think you have to open them. I think you can, we can talk about that without opening that so that he could make the corrections if needed. All right. So Mr. Penny, if you'll, if you'll and, uh, yep, and even ahead. if there is a new application as part of this application, then we have to re-notice that anyways, if even if there's a addition because it is a new application. It, yes. it would be re-noticed. Yeah. yeah. So it's gonna have to be well no I shouldn't say it's gonna if we come to that another application needs to be filed, even just a separate one would have to be re-noticed anyway. So opening or whatever doesn't doesn't matter. Right. Uh, it's just right. What we shouldn't do is entertain discussion and get into the details um, again without the full notice um, of all, mm -hmm. of, even though the, the existing ones were noticed. Um, so, Mr. Penny, if you'll, if you'll bear with me for a moment. So, you've made four applications a finding, um, a variance, uh, two variances under different uh, paragraphs of um, 19032B uh, regarding the lot size and the lot area per unit and of off street parking. Um, and those in and of themselves um, may be valid uh, given what you're trying to do and uh, request to do. But where I think there may be a problem is normally to entertain um, what you're attempting to do here, basically converting a, a building that has been uh, historically a business use into one in the business district into a mixed use um, with residential above um, other uh, retailer or um, businesses. I think we need to entertain this as a special permit under 19032 as a mixed use development. And we may also need to entertain it under 19032.1 with which addresses reductions and or alterations to the dimensional controls or requirements under 19032D in table two, which lists setbacks, height, et cetera. So I think those other sections of the bylaw come into play here and perhaps in addition to what you've already filed, but I, I don't know that we can entertain them unto themselves without also getting into the aspects of the mixed use and the other aspects of dimensional relief that may be required to do what you want to do. So other board members, I don't know if you have any um, thoughts or questions on that. If you've got the bylaws handy, again, I went through this earlier um, and trying to, trying to make sure I understand it properly. Um, but what, what I find difficult, and maybe Mr. Penny can answer this, but normally people get represented by council on situations like this because it is fairly complex. So I'm just wondering what Mr. Penny was thinking. Uh, there's quite a story that goes along with this building. It was abandoned. It's contaminated. Uh, Savage Clean has operated there for a number of years. I got involved in 2016 and purchased the property and have uh, spent a lot of time and effort dealing with the contamination. We've removed a bunch of the heating oil contaminated soil from the basement. We've put a subslab venting system in and poured a new basement floor to prevent the vapors from the dry cleaning solvent from entering the building. 
We've also put in a biological treatment system and we've run it for the last year. Just now we're starting to see promising results. The contamination is dropping. And I had worked with Paul Rivas, I guess the former planning director for a couple of years. And what I filed is based on what Mr. Rivas recommended I do. Hmm, okay. Uh, he's been retired for almost a year, but um, I, I no doubt if, if you spoke to him and he thought that was the right thing to do, I, I don't know. I'm struggling with it because I, I don't know how we don't get into dimensional relief. Um, the, the variances you cite around lot area are small, are perhaps also required, but the other aspects of setbacks and height and, and so forth and the special permit to begin with. I, I just don't know how we. Mr. Jimmy, I understand this building goes, dates back to 1884. Understood. But you're intending to, it's all, been, it's historically been business use and you're recommending that it be converted to. No, uh, originally it was residential second and third floor. And just as recently as 1994 and 1995, the assessor's office has it listed as residential. Hmm. But that's been abandoned for a number of years. Well, it's flip flop back and forth. You'd have to provide, I mean, you'd have to provide proof of that. And I don't know how I'd go about doing that. Yeah, that's why I think you need help on this district. I think. As I said, it, it seems like a a small property and appreciate what you've done to try to remediate the, the issues on the, on the site. Um, I just, I don't, I, I just don't feel comfortable moving forward without having these other applications. Cause I think some of those aspects are going to come into play. Um, you know, that the granting of a special permit um, is more than just, I think what you've applied for um, the variant, those two specific variances and a special permit related off street parking are just, I think, a subset of what the board needs to consider when we're looking at what may happen at the site. Um, again, even though it's an existing building and it's not a large site, um, I think the special permit comes into play. And I just, I'm having trouble Mr. getting past that. Mr. Chairman, I don't want to cause any aggravation. It's late. Uh, but the special permit that we're talking about is only for parking. Two variances of finding in a special permit for parking. Finding that it's no more detrimental to the neighborhood. Dave, you still have to go from business to mixed use. Correct. I mean, we gotta, we gotta get the use squared away before we even talk about the variances. Right. If we don't know the history of the building, Mr. Penny, like what is it classified as officially? Um, what has been the history? And we've dealt with this with some older properties. And usually somebody's done their due diligence and researching how it's been used in the past. Um, and well, provided us evidence so we know how it's properly classified, how it's been used. Um, and again, I think there's it may not be enough just to grant variances on very specific paragraphs and parking without considering the other aspects of a mixed use as part of a special permit. This is a this would be a, a mixed use. I don't know if you'd call it a garden apartment building by the definition, but there's there's lot frontage, lot width, height, setbacks, in addition to parking that would all be non-compliant. We would need, and we would need to find that the the requirements of a special permit um, that could be met with all of those deficiencies. For Mr. us, to, if I could, I've spent a fair amount of time at the uh, registry researching the titles for this property, and I'll tell you what I know, and then you tell me what I should do. But according to the available records, the three-story brick building was constructed in 1884 with a fruit store on the first floor and the residence of the owner on the second and third floors. 
The original owner was a uh, William Guile, and later it was owned by a uh, Charles Spiro. The layout of the property and its proximity to the surrounding properties, I have shown on a plan if I could bring it up and share my screen. Again, I'm, I'm hesitant to go too far with this. Okay. But now we're starting to get into the details and I just, I don't wanna go too far without ensuring that we have the proper filing of all the applications and everyone's been noticed, even though they've been noticed about what you've already filed for. Um, other board members, I don't know, I'm gonna, our attorneys <laughs> Amber. Um, or others. I mean, you've been on the board for a while, Tom, you've been here, Jim, I mean, I'm just, I'm just not comfortable. And I, I don't know if you guys. I, I agree. Can see where I'm, coming from. Yeah. I'm sympathetic to the applicant, but I don't think we have what we need before us to do anything tonight. Are you, are you thinking the same thing that we need the special permit and maybe even the dimensional relief aspects in the subsequent yes. paragraph? Okay. I mean, Dave, and I think I'm with you here, but just to kind of put a fine point on the issue is it's the changing the use of the building. Or at least, or at least officially, maybe it's been unofficially used as that for a while. I don't know. Changing the use of the building, we have to look at that the special permit section. Well, some somewhere it went through a transition. It seems when it went from, you know, residence ownership residence basically, to an office building, yeah. uh, and now it wants to go back to a residence. So we need to understand what the pathway was there. Was there? any notification of change at that time and a decision made at that time to allow for um, basically a business to occupy the whole building or uh, was it you know pre-code type, type of thing that where this happened but like in the yeah. like in the past we've had you know um, electric bills or something else that shows us uh, basically how um, the place transitioned whether you know so so I don't even think we need to go that far, Jim, because that's usually in a case where it's an appeal to us. This is, he is saying that he is changing the use. Right. So we just need that application. If it was a saying, hey, this, you know, in the past where it's, you know, showing the census records or showing, like you said, electric bills, that's usually in saying, hey, it's, this is grandfathered in. It has been used as this, even though towns, you know, somebody building inspector said it wasn't. This well, he's I saying it's changing it, use. It's it's been grandfathered in in this respect is for some time it's been used as an office building. So you know that was the last use. Whether it whether legally it, it folded over from one to the other, who the heck knows? And we may never know. On the other hand, it is being, you know, if if you say you say the building's grandfather right now as it stands. Well, as it stands right now, it's all office space basically and commercial space on the first floor. So now you do go to yeah. how, do we can, how do we convert it back to what it r theoretically originally was, which makes sense basically. And that's what a lot of these buildings were. You lived on the, you lived in the building you worked out of basically on the first floor. Mr. Penny, when you were at the registry, did you find any previous decisions for this property filed? No? No use changes. Okay, that's interesting. I mean, it, it could have evolved and people just didn't do it and nobody sort of <laughs> questioned it or challenged it, um, but it, it certainly could happen today and we would wanna make sure that we're considering and granting the right relief. And, and it's, been rep yeah. it's been and represented it's been to us that it's not used as that right now too, so. Correct, correct. So that's what I'm gonna recommend uh, on behalf of the board. And then I think that's what you're hearing, Mr. Penny. And we're not trying to give you a hard time. Uh, you know, we, we appreciate what you're trying to do to uh, make better use of a building that maybe is underutilized. Um, but I just, we wanna be sure we do the right thing. Um, it protects you, it protects the board, uh, any potential future appeals. And again, this, this gets registered in it. Any future um, uses or changes of uses have this as part of the record. Um, so whether you confer with an attorney or anyone else that can help guide you, um, we can only recommend because you people usually do, especially where there's something not as straightforward perhaps as rebuilding a garage or 
um, some of the other applications we may have. Um, this one gets a little involved and maybe has some history. Um, again, we can recommend, we can't force or enforce that, but we may recommend you um, confer with somebody else on this and just make sure you apply for any other relief that we think you may need. Well, what would be the problem in going forward what I have now and seeking relief under these four submissions and then what would I do when I try to go for a building permit, the building inspector would deny me? Um, I mean, possibly I can't speak to what they would do. It, if somebody could challenge them, you know, every, up, every decision we make um, gets filed and there's an appeal period of 20 business days. Um, somebody could challenge that we didn't grant the proper relief. It would get appealed and it would, be contested it, you know, in a, you know, in a court. But, and I think I don't Dave, want to cause any problems. And I know it's late at night. I, I did work with Paul for almost two years on this. I, I am a professional civil engineer, and I've been on the planning board here in Mansfield for thirty years. Uh, I think we nailed it down. But I, I got to admit, your uh, zoning bylaws. I understand it's a living document. It's a little tough to understand at all. How, how many units are we talking about? Two. So you don't you don't actually qualify under 190-32. Because it's less than four. Yes. So Dave, that's even another wrinkle. And I, I miss the mixed use overlay district by two lots. It's across the street and it's two lots to the east of me towards Main Street. Okay, so you're not, that was another question. I, I, I didn't think you were, but okay. Initially I, told, I was told I was, and then I bought the property and lo and behold, I wasn't. Yeah, and Greg, do you have your bylaws right there? I don't have mine with me. Can you check the um, definition of multifamily and bylaw definition? Yep. I got it. Unless someone else is already there. I got it. I'm mute here. Hold on. Multifamily is four or more. Right. So it's not a multifamily. It's not mid-rise because that's a multifamily, more than three stories. Garden style is multifamily, three or less. But again, because it's not considered multifamily. Dave, can you just run through am I on mute? No. real quick again, what now that we've been running around everything else, what are the actual applications again? I can dig around again. They are, they are um, a finding under 19050B, um, a variance under 19032B one around the lot area per unit, a variance under 19032B2 around lot size, and a special permit under 19036C regarding off-street parking. So Dave, the way, the way I see this, if, if he applied under 190-32, 190-32 doesn't even apply. So he's asking for variance under 190-32. It's just the wrong application. Right, because those paragraphs are, are part of multifamily. And this Correct, is and this doesn't qualify. So I, I think we've just got a whole lot of issues here that need 
looking at them. I, I'm not comfortable going forward. I can't. Mr. Chairman, no, 19032 also applies to mixed use development. That's that's what I'm applying. But you've got less you've got less units than a multifamily. It doesn't it doesn't apply. But it's no, I'm applying under mixed use. Uh, multi and mixed use projects that create street levels. Huh? And it's because I'm within what less than 200 and 2,500 feet from the train station, uh, a smaller lot size per unit is allowed. Yeah, and under 190, you know, 32B1, the minimum lot size for a housing or mixed use project is 4,000 square feet, right? So he's applying for relief from that. It says or mixed use. And paragraph two, whether we're housing, whether mid rise, garden, Attached dwellings are combinations of same, da, 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 minimum of 700 square, 50 square feet per lot uh, of lot area per unit. Mm -mm. Doesn't say mixed use there. Just says mid rise garden attached or combinations of same. Mm -mm. So again, I, I will grant you that the bylaw isn't always the most clear and it, it could be confusing, um, um, but. I'm just not sure what you've applied for is 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 correct right. and or correct, right? And it's not again. We, we're just giving you our thoughts on what we think. Oh, no, I ultimately, really ultimately, it. ultimately, you know, the, the burden is on you to confirm what you need to apply for and, and apply for it. Um, again, I would advise you to uh, maybe reach out to somebody else, um, as Paul has since retired, and maybe may or may not have been. 100% correct in his recommendations. I, I can't speak for Paul, he's not here. Um, um, but that's that would be my recommendation. And you know, the worst case is you confirm that what you've applied for is correct. Maybe we have a conversation offline and confirm that with town council or um, other resources we can lean on. Um, and the worst case is you just come back at the next hearing and we, and we move on. Uh, but if you do have to reapply, then that again goes to notice. We'd be 30 days out and maybe we'd be meeting in June. So we would get here, it's just it may be a little later. That's all. Mr. Chairman, I've been on this project since 2016. Another year won't even bother me because <laughs> this cleanup is gonna take 10 years. It's, okay. it's okay. I don't wanna cause you gentlemen any grief this evening. All right, well then rather than, rather than covering ground we've already covered, why don't we just um, table it? Um, I, again, I don't know that we can continue it because we don't know where we're gonna continue it to um because you may need to refile and then it pushes us out so um i i don't know if board members the proper thing is to just to table this matter for the evening i move that we table it yeah all right um, second thank you any discussion all in favor chip yep uh jim yes joe yes Tom. yep greg yes mike yes and i'm I vote yes. Okay, so thank you for entertaining us, Mr. Penny. I appreciate it and your patience with us here. And um, hopefully we'll, we'll see you at a future meeting. <laughs> All right. How thank should you. I proceed now? Or... Pardon? How should I proceed? Did you say you were going to request something from town council? No, I think um, you, you should probably confer with somebody else. Go hire confer. an attorney. Or at least speak to one who's willing to yeah, maybe give you some free advice. But okay. um, um, I'm saying that we might want to double check our just to make sure we have proper understanding too, if, if such a case does um, arise, that we're um, just a little more clear for our own purposes. So, uh, but that's just more on the board. Mr. Chair, if I may, Mr. Fr Mr. Penny, feel free to call me tomorrow. I'm happy to give you some free legal advice. Right, I'm fumbling for your phone number right now, and I, I have it on my phone. I'll give you a call, and I'll give Thank you, free, you very much. I'll give you free legal advice tomorrow. No, 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 no. Yes, okay. yes, yes. Call me tomorrow. Thank you very much. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Brian. Thank you, Mr. Penny. Have a good night, and we'll uh, we'll talk again. Yeah. All right. That's when Brian shows up. Not when I ask. <laughs> the hero at the end. I'll give you nothing, right? <laughs> <laughs>
I don't know. You probably didn't even hear earlier. I was like, I think Brian said this like a year ago. <laughs> and you were just silent. <laughs> All right. Our next new hearing, 21-58, Mass Mini Mart 2, Inc. at 10 to 12 Vernon Street. Oh, look, Brian's back. Oh, I'm back. <laughs> yep. Um, hold on, Mr. Chairman, to set this up. So you don't have to look at my emails. How's that? We appreciate that. I'm sure your clients do too. They have nothing to hide. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, for the record, um, representing Mass Mini Mart 2 Inc., property at 1012 Vernon Street, attorney Brian McGrail, uh, Pardeep Kumar is here on behalf of Mass Mini Mart. Um, this property is situated. Uh, at Vernon Street 10-12. It's also known as the uh, Route, route uh, 129 uh, Quick Stop, or 129 Quick Stop, um, which is a um, convenience store, um, kind of at the intersection of Vernon Street and Water Street as you take a left kind of near McClellan uh, Concrete. Um, Mr. Kumar, has been running the business for uh, some time. It, the, some board members might recall uh, Mr. Hatfield, Tabell, um, you were on this back in 2007 when um, this property was rebuilt. The building was rebuilt. Um, and, the, and that's where I think the pit stop went in, the barbecue. And um, Mr. Kumar's business is next door uh, and he runs a convenience store. Um, simp we've applied for a fast food special permit. Um, there's really nothing significant here. All he wants to be able to do is to be able to sell sandwiches um, and pizza um, and breakfast sandwiches. Um, all of the, all of the um, stuff will pretty, be pretty much pre-made and frozen and he will reheat it. The sandwiches and will be made uh, fresh. Um, there will be no uh, exterior alterations to the building, so he doesn't have to put in any venting for hoods or, or stoves. Um, he actually has, um, if I may share, a little floor plan. Can the board see the floor plan? Not yet. Mm, you can open up the PDF. Okay, hold oh. on. Oh, it started to come up. There you go. Now you got it? Yeah. Yep. Great. So what he wants to do um, is just set up a little area in the back of the store. This is where you come in. And he just wants to have a counter and be able to have some equipment there uh, to be able to prepare the frozen food or prepare fresh subs and sandwiches. Um, uh, basically, um, coffee. And, and Ben... The Christopher, the building inspector, made a determination. He said, "I don't know what percent sale that you're going to have here, so you need to um, you need to get a, a fast food special permit." Um, to give you an idea of his menu, pretty simple menu that he's put together. Just some breakfast sandwiches. Lunch menu is basic. Pizza is going to be frozen. He just reheats it. That's why he doesn't need any venting on the outside. He's making cold subs and sandwiches, and and then just some sides. Just gonna. It's basically going to be a, a kind of an add-on to his business to try to help uh, cash flow. No seating. Also, no seating. Okay. Brian, do you have to go through public Board of Public Health here too, or not? I'm sure. I'm sure. Uh, Pradeep, have you spoken with the Board of Health yet? Because yes. you're going to have to. Yeah. Yes, I'm. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm uh, already talking with the Coral, and then uh, she. I'm uh, like she's waiting from my end that uh, if the the Board of Field approve that thing, and uh, and then I'm okay to proceed. She came to the store like a, twice, like three times, and then that's what um, I'm waiting for. Dave, do we have anything from them? No. 
No. No, just uh, town engineer, no comments, fire department, no objections, CONCOM not in their jurisdiction. So, so um, it would be good to get something from the Board of Health. So I'm not sure, Brian, if I, I'm probably, if I fully understood you. So they're waiting for us to make a determination and then they're gonna. I, I think basically, um, I mean, it's a separate, it's a separate process. He's gonna have to get a food permit from the Board of Health. And, and that's in, in addition to your fast food. So they're really, they're really separate permits. I mean, you could grant your special permit if you decide to do so. And if for some reason they didn't see it as a fit location for food service, they wouldn't issue their food permit. Um, but I don't think you need to wait for them. I mean, certainly that's your, your decision. Um, you could even put a condition in that, you, you know, you, he needs to get any and all Board of Health required approvals for the, for the, uh, for the food service. That will be fine. Um, and he would need to get those to open anyways. Though, right? He does, Greg. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. So. yeah. yeah. It's yeah, be done. I'd be comfortable. Yeah. 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 Okay. Because he would get if he didn't, and he was serving food, he won't be able to open. They, well, well even down. if he, you know, kind of opened on the side, they would shut him down. You know, yeah, I don't think he'd so, be able to say, "I thought it was okay," because the <laughs> appeal said I could serve no, food. She came over there. We have everything. We have three base sink. Uh, we have all that uh, whatever they required by the the town. I have everything over there. Okay. But we're not we're not changing the convenience store as much as we're just putting in another receiving counter or are we actually changing the configuration of the convenience store no we are just putting the, the small counter for the um, for the for the food service that's it on the left side there yeah can you see it now yeah so Pardeep, are, you, are you put you're putting in this counter no, like uh, on the left hand side, the checkout counter is already exist. This one. Yeah. So just in here. Yes. Yeah. So how about signage? We went through this um, some uh, for Quick Mart or whatever. Quick. Yeah, they got a sign. You're not going to change anything outside on the sign, no. right? No. Well, that goes to the ten percent of window signage because it's it's got pretty nasty at times as to signage on the windows. And, and with this, there's going to be um, sort of a feeling that, that more signage have got to go on the window to advertise this particular operation now. So I guess we would, or I would like to know what's going to happen on the windows. With the windows, sorry, can I speak? Yes. Yeah, the windows stay, stay, stay like as it is. The only the top like 10 inch part that where I can put the sign. The windows it should be the uh, like the vis visible from the outside. You're just gonna put a menu board up inside. Yeah, no menu on the window. Mm -hmm. All right, so we're not changing anything on the windows as they exist now. Yes, no. Okay. Any other comments, thoughts, board members? No. Okay. Again, I read the correspondence. So we'll open it up to public testimony. Anyone has a comment or question, please raise your hand in the Zoom meeting. We'll entertain that at this time. Being no hands, we'll close it to public testimony. I, right. Mr. Mr. Chairman, I move that we grant uh, the fast food permit to 128, is it 129 quick stop? Yes. Or is there a different LLC that we're granting it to? Uh, Mass Mini Mark 2 Inc. Mass Mini Mart 2 Inc. Are you, oh, I didn't know if you were still. 
I wasn't Jenny. still contemplating a thing. Oh, okay. Because um, we had a plan, but it's not really dated or annotated. Um, nor, nor do we. It's yep. interior. They're not doing anything outside, so I don't really care what they do inside. Okay, so that is your motion, granting it a special is. permit. Okay. Anyone care to second? Somebody feel motion? free to second it. Second. <laughs> Thank you. With, with vigor. All right. Any discussion on the motion? All right. That was Michael, right? Yes. Yeah. All right. So um, voting members on this, myself, Jim, Chip, Joe, and Michael. Um, all in favor, Chip? Yes. Jim? Yes. Joe? Yes. Mike? Yes. And I vote yes. Okay. That is unanimous. You have your special permit. Good luck with the Board of Health. Thank you. You're welcome. Good luck to your business. Thank you. I might not Joe. <laughs> He's smiling. I guess so. <laughs> yeah. I used to have a business in Beacon Hill. That's why he used to come over there. <laughs> Was that me? Yes. Beacon Hill? Yeah, my wife used to live there. Yeah, in the top shelf. You remember? Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> nice to see you again. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> All right, let's stop I'll, happy I'll, hour. I'll stop in and say hello. <laughs> yeah, okay. Take care. Thank you, John. Thanks. Good. Thanks, Ed. Yeah. Good luck to you. Thank you. All right, moving right along. Case 21-59, Elizabeth A. Lombardo at 249 Mahon Street. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Representing Elizabeth uh, Lombardo, attorney Brian McGrail, property at 249 Nahan Street. Um, Elizabeth is on with us, and um, also uh, with us is her architect, Mike Avini. Uh, Mike, are you here somewhere? I am. Oh, hi, Michael. How are you? Nice to meet you. Pleasure to meet Great. you as well. I wanted to bring Mike. So uh, this this might be uh, familiar. I'm sure it will be familiar uh, to the board. This is the property at 249 Nahan Street, um, where we divided the property. So it was a little studio next door. Um, and um, and then and so there were two houses. Um, I think probably. Let me let me do this. Refresh the boy's memory. It was the music studio. Correct. Right. That had no electricity, no plumbing. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Here we go. Where Brian took you know, piano lessons, about? if I remember right. Can you see that, guys? Yep. Great. So this was the studio that we got the permit to build a home there with the variants. And then this is this is the house that was associated with it, 249. And just to refresh the board's memory, so there's a house set back here. This is a pretty big lot. So um, what the board did is the board put a condition on this um, when it was approved, the variance, and what the condition stated uh, in the variance to separate this house, it read as follows, and it's, it was submitted with it. I submitted a copy of it with the application. It said the existing square footage and the setbacks of the single family dwelling located on the property shall not change without formally applying for and subsequently attaining a modification of this variance from the board. So when um, when Elizabeth went to, Elizabeth wants to put a Dahmer on it uh, to uh, give some one of the bedrooms some room. Um, she applied for a permit. Um, the building inspector uh, astutely noticed the condition um, and said, you know, gee, we got to get this looked at. Uh, he called Jim McBain, board member McBain, went down um, and it was determined that um, we needed to apply for modification as the condition stated to allow this to happen. Uh, this condition was put on for the folks out back um, that attended that hearing, uh, Pat and Lauren Thorman, nice folks that, you know, they wanted to know what was going on with this property. So, um, so that's why we're here um, to request a modification of this variance to put a dorma or raise the roof a little bit in the back. Um, and with that said, I think it would be appropriate. Um, Mike, can you kind of explain to the board what's happening here? I would be happy to. Can I, um, do you want to share my screen? screen? 
Yeah, yeah. Commissioner will allow me to share my screen. It should. Yes. Yeah, everyone should be able to. All right. Um, so let's see if I can uh, share. Okay. Um, can you see? Uh, can you see my screen? Coming up. There you go. Yep. Yes. Awesome. Great. Thank you. So, uh, um, thank you, um, commissioners and board members, um, and thank you, Mr. McGrill, Attorney McGrill. So what we have here is, uh, again, the property at 249 Hodge Street. And the plans that you see here in front of you are the second floor plans. Um, what we'd like to do is uh, build a small dormer on the back right-hand corner of the existing building. As you saw on the, um, on the shot that Attorney McGreal shared with you and I will share with you in a minute, the second floor of the structure now um, there's a part here and can you see, can you see my cursor as well? Yes. Excellent. So the line of slope ceiling here, you walk up these stairs and there's the, the dormer that I'll show you that exists is right here. And then you walk into this bedroom, this back bedroom here, this modified bedroom is not yet finished. It's all pretty much um, raw studs. Um, I, if I had to guess this house was built circa 1920 when um, Miss Lombardo bought the house um, they found the building permit for the garage um, in the garage. Uh, the card looked fantastic and it was in the 1920s. So I'm assuming this was pretty close post and beam type of construction. Um, but the, the point of the story is that the, the middle of this house is about, um, about seven feet tall. So the, the really the usable bedroom space is, is much, very much limited. So in order um, to make this a little more livable um, and Ms. Lombardo um, thought about, okay, how do we make this uh, bedroom more usable for her? Um, and the obvious answer was to add a dormer to it, um, add a small bathroom up there so that both of the bedrooms could share it and uh, make uh, the, the modified bedroom just a little bigger. Um, so let me just, uh, let me do one. Let me, this might tell the picture a little better here. Uh, we can all see this photo here. This is the existing conditions of um, the back side of two, 249 Nahant Street. The building that you see on the right is 243 Nahant Street. Um, and I believe, um, if I understood uh, Attorney McGrail's uh, opening statement, the variance that was granted for the two, what's now I think 251 um, included um, that this building couldn't be modified. Um, and that was at the request of the 243, the residents at 243 Nahant Street. Um, so that, again, there's the proximity uh, that you can see. So what we'd like to do um, right here where my cursor is, is where the, the proposed dormer would go. And I apologize for the crude photo here, but I did this kind of, I whipped it together today so that I could at least share with um, the board kind of what we're looking to do. We won't raise the roof right now. Um, this is a very short structure. Again, it's about seven feet to the to this, the limited flat ceiling here will tie into the existing ridge. So the structure will not get any taller. Um, the back wall of this dormer might be a foot or so higher than the back wall of this dormer to get some headroom um, to make it worth really doing. But again, as you can see, we're not going outside the footprint of the building at all. Um, I suspect, but for the condition in the zone, um, in the decision to build the house next door that we probably wouldn't even be here. <laughs> it seems like it's a, a pretty simple thing. Um, and I will share with you one other thing. I don't know if um, my attorney McGrail had this, but this is just kind of the lot. Um, so this is the Hot Street 249, the garage that we spoke about a little bit. Um, 243 is back over here somewhere. Um, and this, this lot is a very irregularly shaped. Um, it doesn't meet the frontage, but it's weird because it, there's a, a pretty good chunk of lot out back that's somewhat wooded and overgrown. Um, so expansion further back there probably doesn't make much sense. And obviously there's a condition in the zoning that they're not looking to, I'm sorry, a condition of the uh, decision that they're not looking to um, really do much there, but we'd like to take advantage of the opportunity to potentially not expand the footprint, not raise the height of the building and make it a little more usable. Thank you, Mike. So um, we think it's a, it's a reasonable ask and um, my client Elizabeth is, is here. She did speak with um, 
with um, Pat and Lauren uh, Thorman at 2.43. And I actually think um, Lauren is on the meeting. We'll probably want to be heard. Um, but we, we don't, you know, we obviously, this is why you put the condition in and uh, with the opportunity. So you, you did contemplate that there could be changes. You just wanted to make sure that whatever was done was vetted and talked about and everybody knew it um, and uh, was comfortable with it. So here we are. I think this sort of is, uh, you know, it stays within the footprint. It doesn't raise the height of the roof. It seems appropriate in the way it's presented at this point, in my opinion, anyway. Thank you. And can I just raise one more thing too? Uh, contrary to some of the other things that we heard tonight, uh, Elizabeth Lamato is um, a Wakefield resident, a lifelong Wakefield resident. Um, she, this is her first house that she was lucky enough to be able to buy and stay in Wakefield. So um, this isn't a, a builder looking to do something here. This is a, a young lady who would like to continue her life in the town that she was born and raised in. Thank you for that. Board members, any other comments? Seems pretty straightforward to me. I want to hear from the neighbor. No, we will. We'll get there. I, I, just, want to, I just want to hear from board members first. Is that just a small window on the back? See, thinking of the, you know, the, the, if I remember right, for some reason, was I not at this original meeting? I don't remember this at all. And I don't know why I wouldn't have been there, but maybe I'm just getting old. I'd have been having there. kids. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> Too many. <laughs> uh, yes. So, no, so again, the, the reason I ask is if this variance was at that neighbor's request, obviously views, you know, into their, their houses of concern. So. Fair question. So yeah, I, I had planned um, a small awning window there. Again, the, this this back wall here won't be much more than seven feet, so it's not like we can get a big window there. I'd like to expand the side window here so that it actually is code compliant for a bedroom. Um, so these this this single window on the side of the house will be changed to a larger window, but this window that faces the uh, 243 will be um, smaller, a small awning window just to let breeze in from different directions. Yeah, Greg, we heard this last September, actually. Uh, <laughs> a year ago. We didn't hear it during COVID. Greg didn't vote on it. Thank Is God. that dormer going all the way across? The dormer will connect from the existing dormer to the edge of the roof, yes. It's about 14 and a half to 15 feet. Okay. Greg, you weren't here. You missed that meeting. Oh, good. I have no idea where I was, but at least I'm not going crazy. <laughs> no. no, you're not. Anything else, board members? All right. We'll open it up to public testimony then. Um, if anyone has a comment or question, please right. raise, your, raise your hand in the Zoom meeting. <laughs> yes, Lauren okay. Thorman. Uh, with, a, with the neighbors at uh, 243, we have absolutely no problem with this at all. We're the only, the only reason that we, you know, we're concerned about, you know, you know, maybe like incredible growth of, of the house or, or multiple houses. That's the only reason that we were, uh, you know, very interested in the last meeting. This is, this is absolutely fine. Okay. And sorry, sir, you're not Lauren, I assume. Can no, you just, state, here. <laughs> you just state, state your name and address for the record. Just It's uh, uh, Patrick Thorman, 243 Nahan Street. Thank you. All right, thank you. Going once, don't see any other hands. We'll close it to public testimony then. So Brian, this is a uh, request to modify the existing variance or the existing decision yes. or- the, okay. Modify the variance. Yep, modify the variance, yeah. And how are we, mo we're modifying it to allow just this addition. That's right. That's been presented tonight. Yep, the plan, uh, the architectural plan will be incorporated into the uh, decision. Dated February 27th by, who did them? MAA? No, 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 it's like, I'm looking for the company name usually. We're looking. I'm a self-proprietor, I did it myself. Uh, oh, a friend okay. of the family basically, so. Oh, okay. All good. All right. So then Brian, it's pretty, it will still be pretty explicit then that the, the variance 
itself, I guess, actually continues. Is that what? Oh, yeah. 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 So this the variance going... continues and this is like a. Could be modified again if they came back. Yeah. 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 But yeah. 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 Okay. But that condition holds. So it's, yeah. 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 Uh, someone care to make a motion? Oh, sure. I didn't know we were ready for that yet. Uh, I'd like to ask us something to add. But I, think I, I, I move that we allow the modification of the uh, condition created on the first uh, variance back in September uh, to allow the dormer edition as presented to us this evening. Okay. I have a second. Second. Thank you, Jim. Um, regular voting members and Tom, back around to you, Tom. Um, all in favor, Chip? Yes. Jim? Yes. Joe? Yes. Tom? Yes. And I vote yes. All right. That is unanimous. You have your special uh, modification of your variance. Thank you. Good luck. Thank you very much. Have a great All evening. Right. You too. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Take quiet, Goose. Lie down. All right. Next new hearing, 21-60 and 2161. Keith J. Bernardo and Nicole J. Bernardo at 17 Park Street. They've been on since seven o'clock this evening. They deserve gold stars. Yeah. We appreciate their patience. Yeah. The Busy here. Yes. You don't get a gold star, Brian. No, I don't. I never do. Hi, Nicole. Hi, Keith. Hi, Hi Brian. Brian. Nice to meet you. Yeah. So He's I, the I've been, uh, for the record, attorney Brian McGrill representing Keith and Nicole Bernardo, their property at 17 Park Street uh, in Wakefield. Um, and I've been working with Keith and Nicole for probably about a year, um, trying to, to figure the, their situation out. They purchased this property in 2008, has, uh, has three residential units in it. Um, they were, they thought it was a legal three. Um, then, then basically as, you know, as, as happens usually in, in trying to get ready to finance it, um, the questions came up. Um, and, um, so they, they, we looked into, you know, as we do history, we really couldn't find anything on this to back it up, that we would be comfortable coming here saying, oh, we can, we can make an argument that this is a legal pre-existing non-conforming, uh, three, we wouldn't, it, 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 we, we would not be in good faith. We, we, we couldn't really find anything to support that. We found it scattered information, but nothing consistent. So I said to, uh, Keith and Nicole, the only avenue is, is to try to convert it from a two to a three. And now that creates problems because uh, our concerns with the building code, because, uh, you know, now when you go to it, when you go to a four, um, you've got to sprinkle the building. And um, now it's questionable under the code if you have to do it uh, with a three. So uh, to their credit, uh, Nicole and Keith spent a lot of time with the fire department, Chief Sullivan, um, with the building inspector, Mr. Cristoforo, sorting this out, and, and um, they were able to determine that they would not have to sprinkle it. Um, and so now they've decided to, to try to legalize this unit, which is on um, the third floor of the building. Um, and I can bring up some floor plans. Let me do the site plan first. Um, the site plan uh, shows that the property actually it's 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 situated in the general residence district. Uh, it meets the uniquely uh, and surprisingly because this doesn't happen often, but it meets the lot area and the frontage requirement for the general residence district. Um, and um, you know, but it does not meet the requirement for uh, conversion. Uh, because uh, for conversion, um, you have to have, um, I'm going to go to the bylaw. So you can remember this has 8,000 square feet, 90, 92, 92 feet of frontage, but 80, 82, 78 square footage. I'm 
sorry to be jumping around on this, but it, it is a little bit confusing. So please bear with me. <laughs> Okay. So under 19032G, um, a single or two family dwelling in the general residence district or business district may be converted with the, within the existing footprint and volume to a three or four family provided that the dwelling is located on a lot with 13,000 square feet or more. So we obviously don't meet that requirement. We're requesting a variance. There shall be a minimum lot area of 3,500 square feet for each dwelling unit. Um, so that would be 10.5. We don't meet that uh, because we're at 8,200. So we're requesting relief from that. And then finally, there shall be a minimum floor area of 650 square feet for each dwelling unit provided. Um, we do meet that. Um, because the units, I'm going to go to the, um, the floor plans. Hang on. Bear with me, please. Thank you. Okay. So that's the, the basement floor plan. This is the existing first floor plan that nothing is changing. Second floor plan where the second unit is, nothing's changing on this. And this is the existing third floor plan where there is a little bit of a change and I, and I want to explain this to the board for its consideration. So one of the things that they have to deal with on this unit is create a second means of egress. Uh, that's what the fire chief and um, the building inspector want. So what they're doing, what they're proposing to do that is Things going on. Here we go. Post third floor. So they what they want what they're going to do is create an exit here with a staircase going on the outside of the house. They're going to cut the back of the overhang, and so. This is what they're going to create a shed with the stairs down for that access to the third unit. I am mad comment that the, the stairs in this view are already there and we're just going to be attaching to the existing stairs. Oh, these stairs here. Yeah, those are. Yeah, because those, cause, yeah, cause those serve the second story unit. Yes. Yeah. Thank you, Keith. That helps. So you're really just going to construct from here and connect to it. That's it. Yep. Yeah. Yep, thank you. So one of the things that, so that's the new dormer in the back. And that's where the stairs would come down. The only purpose of the dormer is to serve that doorway. That's the purpose of the dormer. But it raises another question for the board's consideration um, that I, 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 I need to point out. Um, because I don't know. I'm going to ask for that whole staircase to be covered. Hang on one second, Chip. If you, you, you want, Chip, you're asking if they can cover the whole staircase? 
Well, no, I'm not asking if they can. Is Ben going to look for that? Uh, Keith, I don't think he is. Is he? He didn't say the steers had to be covered. No, that was um, not a requirement. And uh, the existing steers are also not covered. So what I want to point out to the board is that there's a provision in the bylaw that um, may be converted within the existing footprint in volume. So I don't know, you know, we've requested a variance from the requirements of this section. I would defer to the board to say, is that dormer for egress purposes an increase in volume? Well, you're not adding floor, you're not adding floor space, right? So. No, and, and you know, and I def I don't know the answer. I mean, you know, that, that to me is a, it's almost like a case of first impression. It's for you to decide. I, I, I don't know. And I guess technically you are right. You can yeah. You think about volume. You can fit more air yeah. in there. That's volume. Floor space is different. Let me show well, it to you, Greg. It 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 is it is more volume. Um, it is more footprint. It's occupiable space basically is what it is. Not that you live in it, but you pass through it. Yeah. You can put air in it. It's volume. Yeah. yeah. Well, normally from the architectural side, it's an it would be defined as occupiable area. All right. So you could stand in it, move around in it, and that sort of thing. It's not a big deal, but it is, it is added area. Well, we know that most of us, if not all of us, know the history of that bylaw and where it came from. And the true intent was to prevent like build outs of home, homes, converting it. And oh, by the way, we're going to throw this big addition on and convert it. That's so right. Clearly not doing this here. It, I, I hear the point technically. By the letter of the law, yes, increasing volume. Um, but if it's that's why I asked, sole purpose is just to serve the doorway, and you're not adding a room that has a door or adding a adding the whole laundry room that has a door. It would be a little more harder to, to justify. But I. But I guess my my question is because I mean we don't want to be saying we well yes in this case because it's easier to justify. Brian, could we take care of it either night? I mean, tonight, either way, in, in a, or would you have to file a separate application or anything? Oh, no, I've, I've applied for it, Greg. Yeah. Because oh, okay. I, All right. I applied for variance from that entire, from the requirements of that entire section. Brian, it, it, would it be appropriate to mention that we spoke to the neighbors as well? Oh, yeah. I was going to get to that. Oh, yeah. okay. But, but since you started down the path, Keith, why don't you go ahead and, and inform the board? So yeah. They, so my, my wife and I went and spoke to uh, as many neighbors as we could on the street and uh, nobody had any opposition and many of the folks even signed a, a letter for us. Um, we have a lot of parking here. We can accommodate yeah. uh, 11 cars actually. That's not our, our intent to increase the space as you know, but there, it is fairly large. So they have a parking spot here and then on the other side, they have a very large driveway with a two-car garage. But we don't have those letters in our record. Do you have them? Or could I you have them. Them? Yep. Okay. I'm gonna, yep. I'll bring them up and I'll email them. Um, hang on. Yep. We'll, we'll include them in the file. Thank you. It's good that you did that. Again, I can, and I can tell you that the two direct abutters to this property are on that list. What about behind Brian? If we are, I mean, small door. Actually, never mind. I don't care. You can't see out there. Yeah. So I take that back. Yeah. We'll say we did receive other correspondence. So DPW. Um, oh, sorry, the town engineer. Um, no comments. Um, Concom not in their jurisdiction. Um, fire chief. <clears throat> And they put some recommendations in here. I assume you've seen them. I have not. Uh, okay. So, because you mentioned it wouldn't have to be sprinkled, but you got to have hardwired smoke and CO detectors must be complied with. They're not already there. Uh, oh, and those are already there. Okay. In conformance. Yeah. And then any, any substantial major renovation will require the installation of fire sprinklers. So, Again, you, you reported that you met with them and they determined that given the, the nature of this. Yeah, and our, our architect also went to the site and uh, went through 
the entire building as well as the garage. And uh, he noted that we, we are not doing any uh, changes to the interior of the building whatsoever. Um, I also received correspondence from um, perhaps uh, someone who um, was notified of this application. We got a handwritten note uh, to the Board of Appeals. Uh, let's see if it's dated April 22nd. Um, from looks like it's 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 in cursive, so um, not something we, we read as much um, these days. But so I'll do my best. Harry J. Petrucci, maybe. Yeah. Dear sir, I am the owner of Two Bryant Ave. My family has lived in Wakefield for about 120 years. My father, and mother, and then myself have owned the property of Two Bryant Street for over 70 years. I am opposed to the granting of a special permit. Oh, sorry, this got put in the wrong, is this? Nope, this is the right property. Okay, sorry, I thought it was in the wrong. Um, for 17 Park Street, because it would be a further change to the character of a neighborhood of one and two family homes and further loss of green space as more parking would be necessary. Thank you for your consideration. Um, so they're uh, expressing um, disapproval, but um, not sure maybe they didn't see the plans because um, there's no changes to the outside of the property. Um, but there it is for the record. Yeah, we, we didn't speak to that person and uh, I presume you're correct. They probably didn't see the plans. Um, and two Bryant, is that behind you? That's out near, that's out near Main Street, I think. Oh, yeah. yeah. I don't think okay. that's true. I don't think that's near us. It's near, but yeah, it's basically on Main Street. They're probably also not aware that this has been operating as a three family for <laughs> some. Yeah, the other, the other thing I just wanted to show the board, this is this is the assessor's records. So it's kind of funky how, you know, it, going back to before the before, you know, before uh, the Bernardos bought the property, they bought it in 08, right, guys? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So, you know, this is kind of what led up to it. It was always referenced as a three and then all of a sudden. It, it starts going being references a two. I don't know why. It was even references a one back in the nineties, but it, but it was a three before that. So we were told it it was a three. And yeah, I mean, but that's 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 why we 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 just in good faith can't come here and say, oh, you know, it could be a grandfathered three because it's just all scattered records on it. Yep. Okay. So again, the board, we would have to find or vary, um, you know, that, that aspect of the volume, small volume increase for the, um, for that dormer, as well as the um, square footage of the overall uh, property or lot and the each dwelling unit. Right? And you went to the um, 650, are those shown on the plan? You went to the plans, but each of them are 650 or more? Yes. They are. Yeah. Yeah. Not even close, Dave. Okay, just making sure it, yeah. it's noted on the plan. In, in, the, in the neighbors in support are at 19, 20, 15, 11, 8, and 16 Park Street. Yeah. Okay. Any 13, from Brian? Brian? 13, no. 13, and, and they just didn't go there, Tom. I, I, I honestly asked the same question. I said, did you get did you talk? And they said, they don't know the people. But they're pretty, they're fairly, um, let me just see here. They're fairly, let's see, just to kind of give you a, uh, This might help you, Tom, from a perspective. They're kind of far away. Uh, the, our property is a great property. It's a pretty, pretty good sized property. Yep. Comparatively. Dave, was it 20, Bryant? 
two. I think it was two. Oh, okay. I thought he said two. That's where I was looking yeah. two, and then two. Okay. Yeah. So it's it's all the way out on Main Street. No, I, I know oh, where it is. It's Harry, per, it's Harry Percucci. I know where it is. Yeah. Yeah. Was it, isn't it is it two eighty two, Tom? Aren't they there at the? What number is it? Two or two eighty two, Dave? He put two Bryan Street. If you look at look for two Bryan Street, it is that Bryan. Exactly. That is that. That's what I thought. Yeah. yeah. I know who that is. Yeah. Okay. Anything else, board members? It, and we do have the uh, the support of fifteen and nineteen. Good. That'd be the key ones, or two of them. I got Nicole. I'm correct on that, right? Yes, yeah, fifteen, nineteen. We've got. Uh, I think it's eighteen across the street. Sixteen, which is also across. Uh, number eight, I believe. Eight and eleven. Eight, eleven. Yeah. In both townhouses at eight. Yeah. So, I mean, not that I want to. Words matter, but that two Bryan Street, there are numerous two or three families on Park Street. So they're not all single family homes. Well, you said single and two, but point taken. Yeah. What did you happen to speak your butters on Bryant, 12 and 16 and 18? Or did so you already list them? We haven't. We've actually, in the time that we've lived there, um, those are all rented. I don't even believe that the um, the they're not owner occupied. Oh, okay, okay. So they've always been um, rented homes when we um, were there. So we've never actually been in contact. I think the one time we might have like seen them in passing, but okay. Well, the owners would have been notified. I was just curious. I didn't know their status, but okay. Yeah. All right. Anything else, board members? If not, for now, open it up to the public. If anyone has a comment or question, please raise it. Your hand in the Zoom meeting at this time. Back. Oh, look who's back. Yeah. <laughs> you got your video running. I guess it wasn't a bad day, huh? It was what? Wasn't a bad hair day. That's why your video oh, broke. Yeah. <laughs> Rails. <laughs> Rails. All right. Seeing no hands, we'll close it to public testimony. Um, back to the board. So there's actually two two votes needed, right here, Brian. The special permit just to do the conversion and the yes. variance on the aspects that are not compliant. Correct. And assuming Chip might be contemplating such motions, do you have the info you need, Chip, on the plot is, plan? Is the... You, yeah. yeah. So I, I can help you. The, this, the, the plot plan is by uh, Paul Finocchio, our PJF Associates. It's dated February 1, 2021. And the architectural plans are by Cornerstone Architects. I'm gonna struggle on this one. Uh, dated February 3rd, 2021. And this is the uh, applicable section of the bylaw. Chip, I don't know if you're in frozen or are you just looking at your. Looks like this video is frozen to me. I think he's over. So I'll, I can take this. Um, I make the recommendation, we make a determination and finding uh, to allow for the three family or the, the uh, the allowance of a three family at this location, along with the changes noted on the drawings for a doorway um, out of the 
a little of the rear of the property. Oh, actually, this is a special permit, isn't it? Special so, permit, yeah, and then the variance is separate. All right, we're making a recommendation for a special permit under Article um, 6, 190-32G, item two, yep. to, allow, to allow for it, to allow this to be a three family. I think he fell off the table. Um, to allow this property to be a three, three, um, a three family and to allow the conversions on the third floor to allow for a means of egress out of the building as shown on drawings like Cornerstone Architects Inc. Uh, dated uh, 2 3 21. That's the motion. Um, do you also want to add the plot plan dated February 1st as well, just for the record? Okay. Thank you. Can I get a second on that amended motion, please? Second. Thank you, Joe. All right. I recuse myself, Dave. Okay. Dave, Jim, Joe. All right, Jim and Greg, batter up. <laughs> um, all in favor, Jim? Yes. Joe? Yes. Tom? Yes. Greg? Yes. I vote yes. So that's unanimous. Now the variants. So a variance from the requirements of the existing building's footprint and volume for purposes of the Dormer to re allow reduction in the square footage from 13,000 to as shown on the site plan. All right, to allow a reduction from the minimum of 3,500 square feet for each dwelling unit to a total of eight, a total as shown on the site plan. That, those are the three, I think. Okay. So moved. Second. Thank you. Any discussion on that motion? All right, same voting members, Jim? Yes. Joe? Yes. Tom? Yes. Greg? Yes. And I vote yes. All right, that's who's unanimous. All right. Thank you. Thanks for your patience tonight. Thank you all. Thank all you. Right. Good, luck. good luck to you. Have a good rest of the night. You too. <laughs> you can log off. We have a couple more. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Have a good night. All right. All right. Moving right along. 21-62, Christopher M. Frenny, Frenny, and Marilisa Frenny at 16 Ames Street. Right. I'm here for the Frenny's. Marilisa, you made it. Yeah. Marilisa got the duty tonight. Her husband, Chris, had to work, so she had to stay up. So um, I represent uh, attorney Brian McGrail representing Chris and uh, Mary Lisa Frenny, uh, owners of property at 16 Ames Street. Um, this is appropriately, in my opinion, the um, at, at late at night, the easiest um, one to deal with tonight. Pretty straightforward. Um, if I can just get to that plan. And is this one that would normally be done by the zoning administrator? No. No, this needs your, oh, this needs oh, you. Um, okay, because we just did that point. and I think it was just ratified, yeah. but okay. Yeah. But you applied before that. Yeah. So the Frenies want to have a pretty simple request. They want to put a front porch on their house and they need a finding, but they need it on the second prong, I think. Um, this is the property. Um, it's kind of a lot going on here, but everything is fine. Um, this is the proposed front porch that they want to put on. Um, as you can see, the existing house is, is luckily, I guess, 19, only 19 feet. Um, currently, the porch will go closer and um, the front setback, all the dimensional requirements are up here in the right-hand corner of the site plan. Front setback requirement is 20, existing is 19.1. Um, and it will obviously meet the side yard setbacks. 
Uh, but since the front setback already does not comply, um, they were able to do this with a finding. Um, but it would be a second prong finding that is not substantially more detrimental um, to the neighborhood. Um, and I would um, argue that it's not. Um, I'm gonna give you a little photo of what it's gonna look like. Right, intensifying the existing nonconformity, but not substantially more detrimental. Okay. Yes, and this is the little architectural plan that they had done. So this kind of gives an idea of what the front porch is gonna look like on that house. Okay. So I would argue that it is not substantially um, more detrimental. Especially considering that uh, there's another street across the way, so nobody's really been looking at it. This is a dead end, right, Brian? Yeah. That's the last house? Yes. So one stipulation, depending on where this goes, is I would not want to see this or enclose it all in the future. It's all right for a porch, but I don't want to see it enclosed in such a manner that it becomes an extension of the house or occupiable space okay. as part of the building. Well, at least you understand that, right? You, you don't intend to enclose it, correct? No. Okay. You're, you're a mute, by the way. Oops. There you go. Okay, there I am. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, no, not at all. We want it open. We want to. It has a porch. Okay. So that you'd, be, you'd be okay with a you'd be okay with a condition to that effect because we've done that before. It may not be the current owner, it may be the next owner. Oh, correct. <laughs> okay. Can we condition a finding? I always get I, I think you that. can from the perspective uh, that you're, yeah. you're yeah, you're determining that it's not substantially more detrimental as long as it's not enclosed. Right, as long as it remains a porch and it's not enclosed, correct. And if somebody ever changed that use, that would be then a need for a new application. Okay. Okay. Any other comments, questions, board members? All right, hearing none, we'll open up the public testimony. If anyone has a comment or question about this one, please raise your hand. We're running out of people that are left. <laughs> All right, seeing none, we'll close with the public testimony. Back to I the recused myself on this one too, Dave. Okay, uh, well, Amy's back and she heard this. Mm -hmm. And Joe and uh, I guess back to Michael. Okay. Spread it around tonight. Um, so we need a, <clears throat> get my paragraph out. One ninety fifty B. Uh, no, 50 A. And B, right? No, just 50 A. The second prong of 50 A. Correct. So we need a finding that the proposed changes to the, uh, existing structure as depicted on the site plan um, by Marchionda and Associates dated September 22nd, 2020, are intensifying the existing non-conforming uh, nature of the structure, um, but that we find that that, um, that change is not gonna be substantially more detrimental than the existing non-conforming non-conformity to the neighborhood. That's what we need and So Thank you, Amy. That's what we needed. Mm -hmm. Can I second? Second. Thank you, Jim. Any discussion? All right, all in favor, Jim? 
Yes. Amy? Yes. Joe? Yes. Mike? Yes. And I vote yes. Okay. So that's unanimous. You have your finding. Good luck. And thanks for your patience. Thank, Thank you. you. Lisa. You're welcome. Thank you so much. Yeah. Have a good night. You too. Thanks. All right, gang, we're in the home stretch. All right, that's it for new hearings. We have another matter at 168 Albion Street, AKA 178, NRP Harvard Mills. And, and they're not going home. forward. Pardon? They're gonna they're holding off for now because they, they still we're still working on some calculations with Mr. McBain. Oh, okay. I didn't know that that's where you're headed tonight. M yeah. Next meeting, perhaps? I think so. You're okay. not. There, there. I sent out um, a calculation sheet uh, on 411, so they're reviewing it. Um, I had to do that because it's complicated with the number of signs and the like. Plus, it's the old over, it's the old sign code. So they've got all the information. They just need to get back to me. We just had to hire an architect to review Jim's calculation sheet. <laughs> <laughs> Make sure you get a peer review. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Fair is enough. is uh, on not signs, but on Harvard Mills? Has there been any indication of when they're going to open the street again? Because not not that you can get through anywhere right now, but I think they represented to us at the meeting that there'd be occasional shutdowns, but at least most of the staging would be on other property that they had rented and now they're essentially just using it as staging. So like, you know, you drive by there and there's no one working and there's just crap everywhere. It just kind of looks kind of you know, ridiculous in a very central part of town. I, I knew I should have brought them, Greg, because I have no idea. So yeah. I didn't, well, I mean, I don't think it's a discussion anyways, because yeah. I think even if we bring it up, I have a feeling they're not going to do anything. It's more the staging of it. They just kept trash out everywhere, broken pallets. I mean, Pieces of equipment just there all hours of the night. It's just kind of looking, you know, pretty drab. And, you know, I, I think that we've given them a pretty good uh, leeway, one, and even allowing them to do the that project, plus closing down the street for so long, they could at least make it look presentable when they leave at night, like a lot of other projects. I, I Greg, I think we have a real legitimate discussion oh. because uh, yeah, they said they were going to use other projects. When we got the construction, project schedule that shutting down the street was ever part of their schedule no they just represented to us that they would have to do occasional shutdowns to to bring stuff up to the obviously the top of the building right. and then uh, a longer not necessarily a longer term one but a, a little bit more permanent one when they had to do the work in the street for drainage or sewer or something yeah and all right. the other yeah all the other staging the utilities stuff like that yeah, and staging and stuff would be done on. They said, I think they said they had rented other property on Foundry Street for that. Was really exactly what they said to us. And now, I, I mean, I guess I don't really care about the closing of the street because fortunately for them, you can't get out the other side anyways. But I mean, it's kind of a hassle to you know 128 plumbing and stuff on that street. Plus, it just looks ridiculous with all their just crap everywhere. Now, who's the contractor? It's them, John. They do their own. NRP, yeah, right? it, I agree with that. It, it is really sloppy, a little bit disrespectful. Not a little bit disrespectful. Yeah. Well, I'll bring back the message. Okay. I mean, I was I was thinking we could reach out to the police department yeah. or you know to find out what they what they agreed to do. I mean, I've seen details down there occasionally, but I mean, um, at the very least, though, like the street being closed is one thing. It's just the using the street as their personal dumpster is a different matter. Right. So, Brian, um, if you wouldn't mind following up with the applicant um, and representatives, um, I don't know. I, I'd be curious what what they've you know told the town. You know, well, maybe, the maybe the department. best thing you know maybe the best thing I could do is I can tell them when they come back for the sign they need to be prepared to talk about that. So, so interestingly enough, if you go on forget where I found it. There is a town kind of pro, uh, Albion, Albion Street, Harvard Mills project site. And it does say, you know, we'll be closed down longer term for, you know, five or six months beginning or whatever. So they, they did clearly work with um, 
Uh, my son is screaming. No, there was, I mean, there was an extensive, there were a lot of meetings on this with Jack Roberto before he left on how this was going to be staged. Um, so, uh, you know, and, and that was true of the building department because they talked about staging it like for pedestrian access, like they did with Maggiore's building with the construction, you know, kind of platforms that you can walk underneath and they're lit. And at the time, Jack said, no way, too much heavy construction. Um, I'm not going to allow people to be walking through there. I want it off. I want it shut. I want it shut off. Now it wasn't discussed how long that would be. Um, but you know, but that was kind of, that's why you're seeing that posting. So there were the town administrator was at those meetings, um, that I was at the school superintendent was there, or I should take that back. I think it was a principal from the middle school because they were concerned about pedestrian traffic that way. Um, there was uh, the police chief, the fire chief, director of DPW, Tom Walsh was there. Who's so there. everybody, everybody but the ZBA. Every, everybody was there. I mean, except for on, the ZBA. Well, who had been I mean, represented think, something. My, my recollection on the project was that on how the staging was going to happen there it was going to be left to the building department and into those departments to figure that out. I, I don't. I think I, I, I would agree. I would agree with you that that's how it was left. That's how it was left. So that's how they're doing it based on that. Um, there was I don't think that gives them a right to use it as a dumpster, though. I, I, I don't disagree with you on that. I mean, I, I, hear, I hear what you're saying. Yeah, I, I guess just next time, too, I think one of the reasons we probably did leave it completely up to that, too, is because they specifically represented they would do it on rented. They were going to use the staging on rented property, which allayed a lot of our concerns. So it would it would be good to get an update at least yeah maybe an outlook of how long the street may still be closed um I, 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 and 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 the, yeah. and the cleaning up of the site well i'm going to tell them i mean we're going to be at the next meeting i'm going to just tell them to be prepared to talk about it i mean because instead of me coming back with a message i think it's better that, yeah. that mark yeah. is before you talk you know and that way he can answer your questions does that make sense guys it does yeah. and, and hopefully clean up in between that too and, yeah i can i can give that message greg right away i'll talk to them about that tomorrow and then okay. Tell me right. you guys want to talk about schedule. Because who knows? We may not be favorable of what they're asking for based on how we're feeling about the project. It may take us a longer time to look at the plantings. Who knows? Yeah. <laughs> All right. I have one other issue, Mr. Chairman, from the building inspector. Okay. And Gail. Um, so we're... we're and, and, I, and I talked to Mr. McBain about this at the building department. We're, we're having, we're having um, some issues with the smaller projects with like the houses where you guys uh, cite um, plans in your decisions, which you need to, you know, it has to be built in accordance with the architectural plan, the site plan. And what happens with the larger projects, you always put the provision that Jim goes down and reviews the building permit plans to make, their, make sure they're consistent. Um, but with the residential smaller type projects, you know, that condition's not there because otherwise Jim would need to have a permanent desk at the at the building department to review everything that comes in. Doesn't he and, have one? And Gail and, about... and Ben don't have the time to look at all of these plans, you know, they, to be the kind of like the, the school teacher for the people filing, filing plans. So we were talking about how to deal with it and, and, and I was you know talking with with Ben and came up with the idea that on the smaller projects the architect and engineer should sign an affidavit uh, to submit with Ben that they have reviewed the Board of Appeals the plans that are part of the condition of the zoning decision and they certify that their building permit plans are in compliance um, with those plans. I guess the only question to that though would be then how do they get caught like if they yeah an affidavit's one thing but if there's no way to yeah. catch inconsistencies you know anyone could sign an affidavit and have it filed away for 25 years you're not gonna yeah, you're not gonna do that with a with a license on the line that's what i mean they, they get a professional stamp on there i don't um, yeah. i i feel that you know what else we're gonna do by the way Oh, and how you catch them is it's a complaint driven business, right? You know, I think the, I think the homeowner is going to have a big problem if uh, somebody, you know, doesn't do it right because it would make them subject to tell them to take it down or redo it, make it right. 
And then they're going to go back to their architect and say, you know, why did you sign the plan? Why right. is this different? And then it comes back and that, that person's license yeah. is at stake because they signed an affidavit saying they're yeah, understood. I, I, think, just I think it's going to save a lot because, you know, and Jim, you know, this. a lot of times, you know, you know, not to pick, not to pick on architects, but, you know, they might look at a plan and say, oh, well, if I move this window or those stairs, it's not really that mm -hmm. big a deal. You know, what's the big deal? Well, not, you know, no, now you're going to sign it and you're going to say that it is consistent with it, 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 um, it complies, it, not it, substantially. Yeah. It complies. No, I know. It, yeah, it, especially because yeah. Brian just said that they might want to move something. What's the word, small. Greg? Greg no, there the is word? no, well, there is no word. You just don't put substantially. It, 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 yeah. it meets, or, yeah, matches. I know what you mean, though. It matches. There you go. Yeah, it, it matches the plans that were, you know, I'm going to work on a form with Ben and Gail. Mm. Okay. I ben, I do that. But he wanted me to, Benny wanted me to run it by the board and make sure that you were okay with that. Gail, can you represent what Mr. McGrail is telling us is truth and fact? Oh, yes, it is. <laughs> Believe me. <laughs> Believe me. What's happening is these people, they come in a couple years after you guys approve something. And we go, we pull the file out. And you know how you go through, you say the plans dated this by this person. They never match. Never. The dates so never match. The, the, they never match. Yeah. Never. So, you know, the, all these big rolls of plans come in and there's like 50,000 of them with all these permits and Ben can't go through and look and see, is the window not here? Is it, is it moved? Uh, the and if, and if, the, if the project's been delayed, it might even be a different person. It, doing it is. The presentation. I mean, just look at 2737. We, we did something with Peter, basically mm -hmm. approved it. And then what did, what did our buddy go out and do? Basically, he went on down to Melrose and got a one person shop that hardly knew what he was doing. Mm -hmm. And then my, so, life, then my wife, my life has been spoiled for three years. <laughs> so is this recommendation for all projects to do this? <laughs> it's up to you. I mean, okay. Well, could, could we leave it up to the building inspector? Like on a certain project, he says here, I'm not going to, you've signed this affidavit. Well, usually and, right, unless, they, unless we keep yeah. the, yeah. I mean, I think in the bigger projects, it's good for Jim to look at the plans because yeah. you're talking mm -hmm. about serious yeah, you know, yeah. money. Mm -hmm. and, but that's when there's a condition anyways, right? Yeah. You have yeah, a condition. So unless there's a condition, it's up to him. Yeah. Unless okay. there's a condition that says that the board needs to review and provide a building permit, then they would have to have an affidavit signed. Okay. Yeah. I think we just have to make sure too we put in who you know if they're not following the if it's not done what you know is there a fine is there a no c of o what's the you know no what's building the, permit no, no building permit issue okay okay yeah. so maybe that's then do we have to put that in there or is that then he just wouldn't give it to him mr chair yeah, are you, are you working on your rules still are you still working on revised rules in my spare time well that, that's something you might want to put in the rules <laughs> right that you know yeah. that's in the rules. I mean, I think it's a good practice. It gets the architect's attention. Because mm -hmm. he is, as uh, Jim says, he's going to think twice before he signs. I said, look at the plans real careful. Mm -hmm. Well, it's architect, engineer, or developer. Basically, it's probably one of those anyway. And it's it's to confirm the building plans match the approved. Mm -hmm. Plans in the in the decision, correct. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like a uh, it's kind of like when an architect signs an affidavit that the that the building's been built by oh who specifies yeah right yeah. it conforms yeah. built the deficit the normal of those are that basically it signs off that your design your documentation meets the state code right. Building so, code. so I guess Brian, one thing to think about too, if you you said you're doing a draft would be, because I think it was a Dave that said it's either the engineer, the developer, or the architect. Is if a person has a set of plans, that person should sign. So it could be, you know, multiple people signing, right? If because yeah. you're not going to ask an architect to say, does this meet the site plan? No, I I agree with you, Greg. Yeah. So you know that's so the site site survey would have to sign the yeah. the site yeah. plan. Yeah. So if it, yeah. I always liked an affidavit at the end of near the end of the project because I can tell the owner I'm not signing it until I get my last bill paid. <laughs> okay, well, thanks for bringing that up. Occupancy. 
No permit. All right. Um, I made a note as something to add to the rules. Anything else? That's all I have. Thanks, Brian. Thank you. And Gail. Any Thank other you. board comments, clerk? Report? I just have a, Gail, where can I see the beginning of this meeting? Uh, I think it's posted two days after. Okay. On yeah. I think it's on YouTube and WCAT. Okay. Or okay. just go to the town website and oh, go to okay. our, our portion board of appeals and recorded meetings there. Perfect. Okay. Yeah. There's a link from our page. Yeah. There's a bunch of ways. Yeah. Okay. Remind the rest of you we can watch her basically at her first meeting too. <laughs> I did good, <laughs> I think. Um, uh, yeah, you missed two hours of fun with uh, the talk, but it'll be good for you to review that one. Yeah. <laughs> um, um, okay, if there's nothing else, we have some minutes from April 14th that might need to be approved. I move that we approve the minutes from April 14th. Second. Any discussion? All in favor, Chip? Yes. Amy? Yes. Jim? Yes. Joe? Yes. Greg? Yes. Tom? Yep. Mike? Yes. And I vote yes. Thank you. Well done. Anything else, board members? If not, the motion to adjourn is always in order, especially at 11.05. So moved. Second. Discussion? All in favor? Greg? You made it. Yes. Jim? Aye. Amy? Yes. Chip? Yes. Greg? Yes. Mike. I voted twice on that. And yes. Joe? Yeah. And Tom? Yes. Thank you. Um, thanks, everyone, for their patience tonight. Um, we got through a lot of ground. Um, and uh, have a good night.